Okay. Hi. Okay. Let's start with uh, equity investments. This is the topic that perhaps everyone is interested. Uh, and this, I believe, is the topic due to which uh, you enrolled into CFA, right? If I'm not wrong. Uh, I enrolled CFA because I wanted to go into equity investments, equity valuation, equity research, and everything related to stock market. This, this was the area of interest that I wanted to go into. But of course, I realized it's around 8 to 10 percentage only. Uh, but the major motivation for me to do CFA was that I wanted to know everything about stock markets. I didn't want to know about fixed income or real estate and so on. I never thought of it before I entered into CFA. So my only focus was to know everything about equities. So this is a subject that has, that has you know, attracted most of the people in doing CFA. Of course, you won't be, uh, you know, uh, you won't be uh, getting full length equity valuation in level one only. In level one, it's uh, to a larger extent, more of a basic introduction of what equity markets are, uh, how do they function, uh, who are the participants here, what is the overall financial ecosystem behind raising money through equity, how the equity markets work and uh, how to value equities in a, in a very basic manner, in a very, I should say, in a very, uh, you know, nascent stage. But in level two, basically, when you go in level two, that's where the larger chunk of equity investments is. That is the point which you are actually going to do in your day-to-day -day job if you are into equity valuation or if you are in investment banking. So in whichever field you go, right, the one thing that, because being a CFA, the one thing that you'll be always... Uh, you know, be doing up regularly is taking decisions on uh, on whether to invest or not. And those decisions are based on your skills of valuation. So that valuation part, you know, we are, that valuation is the focus in level one in various classes of assets. Of course, the primary asset being equities, but also you have fixed income and alternative investments and various other assets. here. So equity investment is going to be very, very interesting. Uh, in level one, they have uh, they have put it in a manner, uh, they have showed up in a manner that, you know, uh, the one who does not have any idea about equity also, the one who is very amateur, does not have any idea about equity investments. So uh, all those informations are also there. So a lot of information that you'll see in level one is something that you are already aware. You'll be like, oh, I know this. I know this is stock market. I know what is primary, secondary, basic things. So many things I'll be, uh, you know, rushing through quickly and many things which probably are new for us. I'll be, you know, uh, focusing more on that. Here, uh, relatively, the calculation part is not as high as it is expected to be in equity investments. You have uh, little calculations. Most of your calculation is in reading number 41, where you're going to do discounted cash flow, relative valuation and asset based valuation. This is going to be the tip of your iceberg uh, that you're going to see in level one, right? Major chunk of these valuation in extended version you'll see in level two. But the foundation is built up in level one. So it's very essential that you pay attention here and you score. Easy subjects are the, those subjects where you scoring above 70 percentile is very, very essential because the more and more 70 percentiles you have out of those 10 subjects, the more your chances of passing. So easy subjects are not to be taken lightly. Those are the subjects where you have to be, if you're comfortable, you have to be excellent. Okay. So we have around six readings here. We are going to begin with the market organization and structure. And uh, here, as I said, security market indices and equity valuation reading 41. That's where your most of the practical part is. However, there is little practical part in reading 36 also, which is what we'll be seeing. Okay. So let's start with reading 36, that is market organization and structure. Now, as usual, uh, what you see is that, you know, I prepare an index out here. And if you see the index is relatively very huge, correct? But don't worry, most of these things uh, we are not going to do in detail here. For example, fixed income, we have an entire, uh, you know, study session for fixed income. Equity, we are going to be dealing with here. Pooled investments we'll be discussing here, currencies and contracts. Contracts is basically derivatives. So we have an entire subject of derivatives where we'll be discussing that. Commodities and real estates, we are going to be discussing that at length in alternative investments. So here you will see various classes of assets, but there'll be just an introduction here. 
uh, in-depth, you know, analysis or in-depth valuation or in-depth uh, understanding of the system is what we have a separate topic for it. So most of the things here beyond equities, which is alternative investments and fixed income or derivatives, these three things, even if they are present here, we are going to deal with them in their respective subjects. We have alternative investment derivatives and fixed income, uh, which we are to do. That's where we'll be discussing this, right? So let's start with equity uh, investments and let's start with the first trading. Now, first of all, equity or debt raising of capital. The major purpose of uh, you know any financial system is help borrowers raise capital easily, help people who want to save or invest, uh, give them a source where they can park their money. So an ecosystem is built around uh, where you have borrowers and lenders. You have capital providers and capital seekers, right? So capital providers want rate of return, capital seekers are willing to pay a cost of capital. And these uh, guys, these, these uh, people are being, uh, you know, uh, channelized through a system that is the financial system. So the major functions of our financial system is to discover the rates of return, the rates of return for the investors, right? Investors who are going to lend, investors who are going to give you capital. This major uh, principle of the, uh, or major function of the financial system is to, you know, be a pipeline, be a chain between those who want to save and those who want to, those who want to invest and those who require capital, right? So it's the efficient allocation of capital that is one of the major functions. People here would come to buy and sell assets, right? And the major purpose here of the entire financial system is that, you know, we achieve our objective. Some people want to do retirement planning. Some people want to raise capital for their business. So all those, uh, all those requirements of funds will be, you know, ensured through the financial system. So basically financial system helps you save, arrange capital, exchange assets if you want to buy and sell them. Trade on information. People do trading or investments based on information in order to generate returns and manage risks. Many people come to the financial markets to manage their financial positions, to manage their risks. Like we do insurance here, we have derivatives through which we'll be managing risk. Now, when I say determining rate of returns, people require rate of returns for the money that they invest. This is called required rate of return. This is called return on your investments. You can say or discounting rate or opportunity cost. If someone invests in bond, they expect a rate of return called YTM or required rate of return or cost of debt, right? The overall market supply and demand of money determines interest rates, which we've already discussed in QM, right? So it's not only the central banks who decide the rate of interest, but now these days, central banks, governments, and various other economic factors, the market demand and supply uh, can decide the rate of interest rates. So capital allocation efficiency, first of all, if there is no financial system at place, uh, where will the borrowers go to get the money and where will the lenders put their money, right? So the financial system is built in a way that, for example, we have banks which are built in a way that people can deposit there and others can do the borrowing. So investors are always on the lookout for opportunities or projects, right, which can deliver them risk adjusted returns based on the risk that they are willing to take, they expect some returns. Primary markets, primary markets will be now studying in the detail as well. Primary and secondary, there are two types of market. Primary market is the market where, where companies or governments go and raise capital, correct? And secondary market is the market where, where the investors trade the securities, correct? Allocation efficiency occurs when the money by investors is invested into the most profitable projects. Accurate market information. We, we are going to deal with a topic which is about market efficiency. That is reading number 38. Market efficiency means that in order for market to be efficient, the flow of information should be well enough. So an efficient market is a market where the information uh, is uh, unbiased and quickly uh, delivered. So accurate market information leads to capital allocation if the information is unbiased. However, if the information is biased or motivated, people won't trust the capital markets and people will find it difficult to raise money through the equity markets if they don't trust them, right? So market efficiency is very important. Market efficiency means that the flow of information is quick and accessible to everyone. There is no insider trading out there. 
okay there is not information only available to few people that is what market uh, uh, efficiency is so majorly the functions of financial uh, system the financial system we are going to see what is financial system until now we have not seen what is financial system but the major functions of financial system are helping people generate returns helping people get the capital and they getting easy information so that they can trade on the investment that is their major functions clear now when someone tells you what is finance what is finance now we we are of course in the field of finance and we are going to be in the field of finance but if i want to ask you what do you think is finance if you were to explain me in a minute or in 30 seconds everything that you know if someone asks you a very general question what is finance what will be your answer what is the world of finance anyone you you are trying to build your career into finance right So, investments okay that's it the i want an answer from you all when you are going to build your career probably next 20 30 years into the world of finance tell me at least for 30 seconds on what is finance or what do you know about finance you're going to build uh, you're going to put in so many years into this world right so tell me what do you know what do you think how can you explain someone what is fine how do i explain that to yes. uh, a kid what is finance it can be like um, buying or selling okay. any asset commodities or it can be hmm. capital market any like different markets okay uh 30 seconds are not done <laughs> no but good try so uh, the world of finance is made up of the financial system and financial system financial system consists of what consists of financial instruments now financial instruments are those products which people will buy or sell those who need capital they will sell it like bonds and equities and those who want to invest they will they, those who have savings they will invest in these securities to get a rate of return those are financial instruments financial instruments are those instruments as i said where which people can buy and sell so that those who want capital may get capital and those who want some returns will invest that is financial instruments now these financial instruments are not sold on in walmart or amazon right these financial instruments have a financial markets they have financial markets so financial markets are the place where you will find these financial instruments bond market equity market currency market and so on so financial instruments are sold in financial markets and who are the participants here the participants there are called financial intermediaries so financial intermediaries are the ones who are going to be the ones who will be help who will be helping you to get the financial instruments for example dealers or brokers correct uh, traders investors they are the participants in the financial markets so financial system is majorly built with financial instruments these instruments will be or financial securities we say these financial instruments or securities will be trading in financial markets and and in this financial markets the players or the participants that you see are called financial intermediaries clear everyone that's what the world of financial uh, markets or financial system is basically so the world of finance consists of financial markets financial instruments and financial uh, intermediaries or participants right so let's deal with them one by one so what is a financial market a financial market is uh, you know a market for different asset classes what are asset classes asset classes are those type of assets which have similar characteristics and they are grouped together 
For example, when I say risky assets, so equities are risky assets. So different types of equities are clubbed together. That's one of the asset class, right? Fixed income is a different asset class. Alternative investments, in that alternative investments, you have commodities, real estate, and hedge funds and venture capitals. Those are risky, uh, different asset classes, alternative investments. So they have those who have similar characteristics are clubbed together and they are called asset classes. Classification of assets can be based on financial or real assets. Financial assets are bonds and equities, right? Real assets are those tangible or physical assets like real estate, equipments. Those are, those are assets which, you, which have some physical substance, clear? Debt or equity securities. Well, we are aware debt securities are bonds where uh, the borrower promises you, you to pay a uh, return till the maturity, correct? Equities are securities which gives you ownership. Bonds, do, do the bonds give you ownership? No. Equities give you ownership, correct? Then you have public and private security. Public security are securities which are listed. Private securities are those which are not listed. They are not traded publicly. So you can't buy and sell their securities easily, right? Spot or future market. Spot market is for buying and selling immediately, which is for immediate delivery. Whereas future market is where you are going to book a contract for delivery, delivery now or in the future, for delivery in the future. Clear everyone? Right? Clear with different types of markets? Yes. Now, these markets can be further classified, uh, you know, on the way they transact. For example, primary and secondary market. Primary market is the market where you first time raise capital. So in the primary market, who are the people? The company which wants the capital and the people who are willing to invest in it, right? So primary market is a market between company and investors, right? Or potential shareholders. That's also what we call as IPO, initial public offer. Secondary market is where is the company involved in the secondary market? No, it's between the investors. They buy and sell securities on the exchange. So that's the secondary market. Clear? So in primary market, who are the participants? The company and the investors. In the secondary market, who are the participants? Is the company the participant there? No. In secondary market, it's the investors who trade between the securities on a platform, which can be a stock exchange. Clear? Money market or capital market. Money market is a market for short-term borrowing and lending, whereas capital market is a market for long-term borrowing and lending. Can you tell me which is a bigger market, money market or capital market? What do you think in terms of volume? Any idea, anyone? Money market, sir. Money market is a much, much bigger market uh, in terms of volume. Money market is uh, very high compared to the capital market, right? Then you have traditional investments like what we have been discussing, debt and equity and alternative investments, which we'll be discussing in length, where you have hedge funds, commodities, real estates, collectibles, gemstones, arts, fine arts, basically uh, like paintings and all, right? Those are alternative investments. Standardized or customized contracts, standard contracts, basically when you deal on exchange, for example, for derivatives like futures or options, they are standard fixed contracts contracts which are fixed size and fixed maturity customized contracts are the contracts where you can you know customize it based on your needs those are forwards or swaps these are the contracts in derivatives which are customized in nature you can go ahead with the investment bank and create a contract the way you want it's a tailor-made suit i say that's a customized contract and uh, you know uh, standard contracts are basically you buying a ready-made garment you can say Correct. So that's the difference. This is what we are going to discuss in detail in derivatives. You'll find me talking this again and again, uh, you know, in this uh, reading where I'll be saying that, you, oh, we'll be discussing this in detail in fixed income. We'll be discussing in detail in alternative. We'll be discussing this in detail in uh, uh, which derivatives. That's what will happen here. Okay. So clear different types of financial markets, financial assets, real assets, primary, secondary, money market, capital market, everyone. Right. So there are various types of markets and various comparisons between the markets. Okay. We've discussed here classification based on the types of security and classification on where they are transacted. Clear everyone. Any questions? Anyone? Any questions? No. Okay.
Now, this is financial markets. I told you the financial system is made up of three things, financial markets and uh, financial securities. In the financial markets, what do you find? You find financial securities. And who are the people going to deal with them? Those are the financial participants, right? Or financial intermediaries. So after understanding financial markets, let's understand what are the different types of financial securities. So financial securities are basically those securities which help you, which help you either raise money or invest your money. They help you either raise money or invest your money. Now, most of these securities market, you're already aware. I'll quickly highlight on them. I've given in detail write up which you want. You can read it for your reference. But many of the things we are already aware. So I'll just quickly go through it. Fixed income. We all know bonds. Bonds. What is the thing with unique thing with bonds? They have a limited time period. Till that the borrower pays you coupon, which is what we call as uh, interest year. We call that as coupon. And on maturity, they pay you your principal back. Clear? But do the bonds have ownership or voting power? No. They don't have ownership or voting power. Clear? Bonds can be raised for less than one year, which is what we call as money market instruments, or they can be raised for more than a year or more for a longer maturity, which are called uh, bonds or long, uh, they are also called as notes. Equities. Well, what are the types of equities? Generally, you know, as I said before, in India, we say equities and preference shares as a separate thing. By the way, preferred, preferred equity is a part of equity. Overall, equity consists of common equity and preferred equity. Who gets paid first? Preferred. preferred, right? The name itself says. After the preferred equities are paid, the common equity gets paid, right? Now, common equity, they are also called the ones who get the residual ownership or they get anything which is left out. So all the dividends, uh, you know, they, they their dividends are not fixed. The dividends are uncertain, but the all the remaining chunk belongs to them, right? They are the most riskiest and therefore they expect the highest return. Preferred stocks have preferred rights in terms of getting the dividends, right? They, they, have, they have a higher hierarchy, of course, after the debt. They are very much treated by analysts like, like bonds. Why? Because if they have a maturity, they're treated like bonds because they'll have to be paid back at some point of time in the future. Equities do not, uh, common equities do not have a maturity. So most of the analysts never put preferred equity as a separate thing. If the preferred equity is redeemable, they adjust that preferred equity as a part of, they consider that as a part of liability only. Clear? So tomorrow when you do valuation and if you see preferred stocks in the company and if they are redeemable, what are you going to do? You're going to consider that as a part of? Liability. Liability. Okay. Then there was a very famous thing in the past. Now, of course, people don't use it much. That is warrants. Warrants. Warrants or warrant basically this is what this is a guarantee or a warranty we use this word quite often it's an instrument uh it's it's you can say it's a it's a coupon which is or, or it's it's uh it's a guarantee you can say you can use it anywhere by the way it is attached to a bond so let's say i buy a bond from company x along with that bond the company also gives me a coupon a free coupon what does that coupon say that I can buy the stock of this company, let's say after two years at a fixed price, let's say that price is $100. Now, right now, the company share may be around only $60. But this coupon gives me the right. What right does it give me that I can buy the share of the company after two years at $100. Now, when would this coupon or when would this warrant be attractive to you? It would be attractive to you if after two years, the company share price goes over and above 100. Let's say the share price is 180. Then what is the advantage that you have? You have an advantage that you had this coupon, which gives you the power to buy the share at $100. So after two years, if the share becomes 180, you can, you can redeem this coupon and get the share at 100. 100. And you can sell that and make $80 profit. However, if the share price does not go above 100, you don't lose up anything because you, because you did not pay $100 for it. Clear? So warrants are basically, they are a right which is given to you, which is given to the holder of the warrant where you can purchase the company's common stock at some point of time in the future at a fixed price. Right? However, for getting this warrant, you have to pay a small token amount today. 
it's called the premium so you pay a premium today let's say to buy this stock at $100 after 2 years i have to pay a premium of $5 now so how much is my costing if i exercise the warrant after 2 years i pay 100 plus 5 so 105 will be my cost correct however if the share price goes above that that warrant becomes lucrative and attractive clear so it's a bet that you put but how much do you lose if the share price don't turn up above 100 you don't lose hundred dollars. How much you lose maximum is five dollars. Okay. Now, do you realize there is an exact, an instrument like this today, where you get a right to buy something in the future by paying a small premium today, and the maximum you lose is premium. What instrument do we have? Something like this today. Option. 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 Absolutely. Options. Options. Call options, basically. Right. You have that choice already in the financial markets now, and those are more liquid than warrants. Therefore, these days people prefer less of warrants and they directly trade in derivatives if they want to bet in that way. However, many companies who sell bonds and if they want to make their bonds interesting, I can say if they want to put some spice or masala on the bond, how can they do that? They can, you have a choice either to just sell a bond either or either to sell a bond with warrant. What will be more attractive for an investor? Just buying a bond or a bond with warrant? Of course, a bond with warrant will be a little more attractive, isn't it? So companies do this thing to attach the warrant with a bond so that the bond becomes more interesting. Clear? However, as I said, these days, less of warrants are used. Okay. Why? Why? Because we have an alternate that is called options. So debt and equity clear, everyone? Anyone, any doubts? Okay. Uh, then next is pooled investment. Pooled investment. What are pooled investment? These are financial institutions which pool money from people and then they invest in debt and equities. So pooled investments who who do who who are the institutions which do that mutual funds hedge funds uh, sovereign wealth funds insurance companies even banks they gather money from people and then they park in bond and equities of another companies right so those are called pooled investment they are indirect way of you investing in markets who are the people who go to to pool investments well, those people who do not have time to directly manage their equity investments, those who do not have an idea and those who want to diversify at probably lower cost. These are the guys who will go, who will invest in the debt and equity market, but indirectly through the pooled investments. Clear everyone? Right? Now, these pooled investments can be open-ended or closed-ended. Open-ended means you can enter and exit at any point of time. And closed ended funds are where the funds are open for a limited time period. Uh, and after that, neither an entry or exit is allowed. So it's like, you know, uh, blocking your money. That's what closed uh, funds are. There are very few closed ended funds, but majorly most type of funds are open ended funds. Clear? Currencies. Currencies are basically people use currency for transactions, for trade. And uh, some people use uh, keep currency as reserve. For example, India has dollars uh, has reserves uh, as reserves, and we have more than five hundred billion dollar reserves as of date. More than five hundred billion dollar reserves, and most of the countries in the world keep currencies as reserves. Many many uh, countries look use dollar or euro or pound as a reserve currency. Who has the authority to print the currency? Well, of course, it's the central bank, correct? But uh, why do people keep, uh, you know, dollar or euro or pound as reserve currency? Anyone has any idea? Anyone? Why do countries keep dollars as, as reserves? Basically, when I say uh, we are we are having 500 billion dollar of reserves what does that mean does it mean that we have 500 billion dollar of cash stored in our vaults yes everyone what do you think when i say we have india has 500 billion dollars of us dollars 
what do you think does it mean that we have 500 billion dollars of cash held somewhere uh, beneath the ground or in some of the banks do you think that what do you think everyone hello no no sir so no sir so tell me what do you think when we see 500 billion dollars of reserves i we have mm -hmm. come on think you're going to be financial. like invested in some other things which place in the currency like basically so explain me how it's not going to happen that you just uh, you all just listen to what i say these are common questions and these are things that you read very often so when i when i say let's say uae or india or canada or any other country has billions of dollars of reserves what does it actually mean well it actually means that we have parked this money in us treasuries you can say right you have parked this money in us treasury so you you're holding bond of 500 billion dollars you can say clear everyone or you have these much of uh, your investments with the with the uh, imf you have th that much of uh, you know uh, capacity to withdraw from imf you can say clear so india has around 500 billion dollars of reserves but do you know a country which has the maximum amount of reserves which has which has around 3 or 3.5 trillion dollar of reserves of us dollar china china is the country so china is having huge 3.3 or 3.5 trillion dollar of reserves of uh, us dollars right so because china does exports globally and most of its exposed exports are in us dollars and its major trading partner is also us so it has you know a plenty amount of us dollars as a resource so i i just wonder why they keep on fighting when they are both you know they are both trading partners heavy trading partners so whether they like it or not uh, china sells goods to us and in return china invests in us treasuries okay so it's it's the cat and mouse race i don't at times understand why do they keep on fighting except for the political matters fighting who is the best uh, you know uh, we'll discuss that uh, you know when we uh, talk unfortunately we don't have too much of details in currencies here but uh, you know there's always the hist history has said that you know the, the race between number one and number two is always ugly and that race uh, between number one and number two in with respect to countries you know it boils up everyone it creates uh, the, when the number two is coming close to number one the number one becomes very jittery very insecure and that's 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 a clash which has always been there in the history of course someone is challenging us so close uh and not only with the military strength but with the economic strength the last time someone tried doing that we had a couple of world wars so and after that someone trying even to be uh you know dominant trading partners of us you has uh, there has been many wars in the gulf and so on but this time china is a different thing china has grown and outbeaten its closest trading partner that is us so even korea has grown because of us and they have been uh, the biggest trading partners of us in the past uh, but they were never a threat to us because us had quite control on korea because of the internal war that south and north korea had so us in a way protected the south korea so they dealt with south korea south korea uh, flourished became a developed country today right but they were always under the shadow of the us uh, you know because of the military threat that they had from the north korea that was not the case with china right china was independent it didn't require any military support it was strategically strong and it became more strong after the financial might that it had so that's the one place where us its largest trading partner us could not dominate it to that extent right that was the thing
However, coming back to currencies, currencies is the world's largest trading market, largest uh, a market with largest uh, you know turnover. So around there is three point five trillion dollar, three point five trillion dollar of daily turnover in the currency market. So currency market is said to be the largest in terms of turnover or in terms of volume, right? These markets are mostly not traded on exchange, but traded outside the exchange, which is what we call as OTC over the counter. Okay. Mostly the participants here are commercial banks, retail banks, brokers, uh, exchange, uh, money, many, many uh, trading exchange and so on. Right, like Western Union money transfer and so on. Currencies can be traded in the spot if you want it immediately, or you can book it the forward if you are an exporter or importer, depending on when you have to pay or receive. Clear? Anyone any doubts with currencies? Anyone? Okay. Now contracts. Contracts are basically derivatives uh, where you have uh, contracts. They are basically agreements. To buy or something at some point of time in the future, uh, we have forwards, we have futures, we have options and swaps. These are contracts. So, in contracts, you have forwards, you have futures, you have swaps and options. We are going to deal in much detail in derivatives. So, I'm not going to detail. Uh, disc uh, I'm not going to do a detailed discussion here. One important thing about contracts is that contracts can be settled in cash on maturity, or they can be settled with delivery of assets. For example, I've booked a forward contract for buying gold after three months. So if the prices go up, I can simply take the difference and settle it in cash. Or I can physically take the delivery of the gold. Are you getting my point? So contracts can be settled in cash. And when they settle in cash means what? Only the difference of buying and selling price is exchanged. Got it? So you don't physically get anything or they can be physically settled where you take the delivery of the asset. Is that clear everyone? Everyone yes. clear about contracts. Anyone, any doubts with respect to contracts? They can be physically settled or, or with equity. cash settled, physically settled or cash settled, right? Those contracts which are settled in cash, they are also called as contract for differences, where only the difference is settled. You don't take the delivery of assets. Okay. Forwards are traded in OTC. They are customizable. Futures are traded. Futures as well as options are traded on exchange and their standard contracts. Swap is a customized contract where you exchange the position. You give something and in return, you get something. Those are swaps. Options, options are contracts where you have right, but not the obligation. They are very unique compared to other instruments. They are one of the, I should say, uh, well, we are going to deal with one entire topic on options, but I think they are one of the most creative things in the world of finance. Options are contracts where you have the right, but not the obligation with the buyer of the contract. And then there is a seller of the contract who has the obligation, but not the right. So there are two types of position there, long position and short position. Long, basically the one who has bought the option and short is someone who has sold the option. Don't worry, we'll be doing that in detail when we go to options, where we discuss call and put and long and short and everything. Okay. These days you also have, uh, these days, I mean, from the last couple of decades, you also have some very complicated contracts like CDS, credit default swaps. Have you heard about it, everyone? Credit default swaps. Anyone? Heard or not? Not. Credit default swaps. So these are like insurance on the default of, let's say, a bank or a financial institution or a company. So anyone who's bought a bond and is worried that the bond may default or the company may default can buy an insurance by uh, can buy an insurance by taking a cds credit default swaps so credit default swaps acts as an insurance where the payment is guaranteed so in case if your company where you have put your money if that gets default uh, you get that insurance from the cds however for that insurance you have to regularly pay the premium 
to that company or who's selling the insurance or who's writing the policy. Those are credit default swaps. CDS are one of the biggest reasons of, of uh, I should say, the growth of US banking system as well as the collapse of US banking system. Okay. No, I, I should rather correct myself. CDS are also the reason of growth of US banking system and collapse of global banking system. Are you getting my point? Why collapse? Collapse? You didn't you see what happened in 2007 8? The entire banking system got collapsed. And those large banks had to be bailed out by governments across the world. Are you not seeing today also? so many banks getting collapsed right because of uh, the financial mess they are into you still see the repercussions of that so people started doubting the banks itself after the huge derivative contracts that they were into uh, during the 7 8 crisis of and all thanks to cds where banks had taken enormous position by writing off the you know credit default swaps and when the when the bonds got defaulted bank had no money to pay because they had huge liability so cds became a very big issue we will discuss when we do uh, cdos you know collateralized debt obligation we have a topic in fixed income where we are going to do and understand securitization business how the securitization uh, system works and there we'll be discussing what is the reason behind the collapse or the growth, both, I should say, of US banking system. Okay. Those are basically options and contracts. Then you have commodities market. In commodities, you have agriculture, metals, uh, you have uh, precious metals, correct? Then you have energy stocks, uh, energy related commodities like uh, crude, gas, and so on, right? So commodities, they, they can be traded physically or they can be traded on exchange also. Commodities complement the investment opportunities offered by shares of corporations that extremely use this raw material. So many people also put their money in companies who deal with commodities. For example, I'm putting my money in Adnoc or Saudi Aramco. It's like I indirectly getting an exposure to crude. Got it? Same way you can have real... Uh, real assets like uh, those are the tangible assets basically uh, real estates or investing in exotic cars planes machinery or any particular asset which gives you you know access to the physical substance of it so however you have to understand that with most of the real assets there is a high storage and maintenance cost and they're very illiquid and whenever you sell them again, you may have to pay a high transaction charge. The transaction costs are high with respect to real assets because of their physical substance. Clear? So these are various types of instruments where you can either park your money, you can trade with them, or you can raise capital through them. Everyone cleared with financial securities and financial markets. Everyone? Any doubts? Anyone? Anyone wants to discuss or share anything? Uh, there are basically alternative investments also and these investments we are going to learn in detail uh, i would also like to point out here that these days you have a lot of investments which are not a part of your but like bitcoins all these cryptocurrencies institute has recognized this and they have added a topic called fintech in portfolio management where we'll be discussing about cryptocurrencies so these days a lot of new investments avenues are also coming into the market of course institute has a tendency to you know revise or update the portion every year and they try to make it as close to reality uh, so you know every year you'll see what are the new products which are added into the financial markets probably in a couple of years down the line you may also see them in the syllabus clear everyone so financial markets and financial securities now, who are the people who are going to deal with them? Well, they are the financial intermediaries. Who are financial intermediaries? They help you. They help you get these financial securities, right? So who are they? Basically, you have brokers. Brokers are the one who, what do the brokers do? Brokers are the one who take the orders on behalf of their customers, right? 
so they accept the trades and route it through the exchange so i am a broker i take trades on your behalf and on your behalf i buy or sell it on the exchange and in return i take the brokerage correct there are also block brokers what is the difference between a broker and a block broker a block broker is a specialist who deals with large quantities large quantities they are the ones who have the expertise to execute large quantities now you would wonder that what is the difference in executing large quantity well when you are trying to sell huge quantity there is a possibility that you may not get the desired price so these are specialists which will execute in a manner that you get a proper valuation right so they deal with large quantities those are called block brokers then of course you have investment bankers investment bankers help you raise capital uh, they help you underwrite the securities and when they do underwriting basically what is underwriting underwriting is the process where it's a merchant banking process we say where they help you raise capital from the financial markets they take the responsibility of you know uh, placing your shares in the public but they they offer you two services best offering best offering and underwriting offering best offering is the one best effort offering is the one where they will not take the guarantee they will try to sell it as much as possible right but in the underwriting offering what will they do well they will take the guarantee of your entire issue so let's say you want to raise 100 million dollar they will take the guarantee that okay will be will be raising 100 million dollar for you from the public if the public does not invest we'll put in our own money we'll take the responsibility however for that underwriting commitment they may charge you a higher fee clear these investment bankers are uh, are some sort of advisors or brokers you can say they also help uh you know arrange merger or take over between companies clear they have a range of other facilities also but their major work is to be a mediator between two trans to two participants clear exchange what does an exchange do it provides you a system or a platform where you can buy and sell securities right however exchanges are regulated by the exchange commissions so we have securities exchange commissions which will regulate the exchange and which will decide on the rules and regulations of the exchange clear now exchanges are standard contracts right but if you want to trade beyond the exchange we have a system called ats ats are alternative trading systems they are non exchange trading venues that bring together buyers and sellers of securities they do not exercise regulatory authority see i am discussing this ats because ats is quite new for a lot of people so ats is not an exchange but it's a it's a independent platform where you can buy and sell securities right and electronic communication network which is called as ecn connects major brokerages and individual traders so that they can trade directly between themselves and here you don't have to require an exchange dark pools are ats that do not display the orders dark pools so basically you are buying and selling but uh, you just sell your uh, send your order and you don't know the counterparty what at what price the order is you will just come to know whether the order is executed or not they are usually these these are the markets which function without the you can say without the control of the regulatory authority that does not mean that they are illegal but uh, here there is no guarantee by the exchange it's a it's a market between buyer and seller only there is no exchange with standard as a middleman and therefore uh, you you can probably uh, face uh, you know counterparty risk here what is counterparty risk that the counterparty may not accept the trade or your trade may default clear so the biggest difference between exchange and ats is that in alternative tra trading system there is no middleman there is no exchange to take the responsibility of your trade got it everyone uh can you tell me that exchange uh, is with i can say with equities but ats is with is famous with which type of securities anyone can guess which types of securities generally people trade on ats platform not listed not listed correct you can say private uh, uh list uh, private securities okay anything else bonds many bonds uh, are traded on ats because what if the bonds are not listed and you want to sell so like equities or bonds which are not listed 
they can be bought and sold on the ATS platform. Clear? Everyone? Now, broker's job is to broker's job is to arrange you uh, uh, arrange a seller for the buyer or buyer for the seller and help execute the trade. Correct? So you sell or buy to the broker and then the broker sells it or buys it from the exchange. However, slightly different from the broker is a dealer. A dealer executes or fills their client's order by trading with them. They provide liquidity to the market. So broker will just help you execute the trade. It's just a middleman. So broker does not take a counter position with you. So if you want to buy, broker will buy on your behalf. If you want to sell, broker will sell on your behalf. But a dealer is the one who will take a counter position to you. So if you want to buy, uh, the dealer will be ready to sell to you. And if you want to sell, the dealer will be buying to you. And then the dealer will do the same with some other dealer. This is very prominent in currency markets. For example, the bank is the dealer. So I want to buy the currency and the bank will sell me the currency. Bank will not act as a broker that, you know, bank will arrange someone else. No, bank will take the position against me. Right. So they execute or fill the client's orders by trading with them. So the more the dealers are there, the more choices I have to buy and sell the currencies. Right. So they provide liquidity to the, to the market and they trade with the clients to earn a spread. What is a spread? For example, I sell to the bank a dollar for 50 rupees. So the bank buys from me at 50 rupees and the bank may sell it to another bank for 52 rupees. So they basically make two rupees on a dollar. That's a spread bit that they make between buying and selling. So they take, they enter into the position and then they sell it or they buy it from, from with the other dealer. So dealers try to enter into the market to earn the spread. They don't take brokerage from me. They earn a spread. They earn the difference in the price. Clear? Got it, everyone? So everyone cleared the difference of role for a broker and dealer. A broker will, will the broker take counter position with me? No, the broker will only, the broker will only help me execute and take a brokerage. Clear. But a dealer will take a counter position with me. The dealer will enter into the trade with me and they will earn a spread. Now, in many cases, the, uh, the institute that I'm going to deal with, that institution itself acts as a broker as well as a dealer. Those are called broker dealers. So most brokerages are in fact broker dealers. They deal with the customer and they also trade with their own proprietary accounts. Are you getting it? So what do they do guys? They also help me execute the trade and at times they also take the counter positions. So they earn the brokerage. They also earn a spread. Clear everyone. So for example, when you deal with currencies in bank, banks also charge you, uh, you know, service fees on your currencies and they also charge you a spread on the currencies. Banks charge you both. So I, I generally say that when you're dealing in currencies, banks are not only the brokers, but also the dealers because they charge you commission for the service and they also charge you spread for the currency. Are you getting my point? Yes, sir. Everyone. So banks are not just brokers. They are broker and dealers both. Almost all investment banks have large dealing positions like Europe's biggest, uh, you know, bank in terms of investment banking is Deutsche Bank, RBC Capital from Canada, Nomura from Japan, Goldman Sachs, USA, UBS, Barclays from UK and so on. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Citibank, they are one of the world's largest, you know, investment bankers and they, they, they have their platforms where they provide the broking as well as the dealer services and they provide both as well clear in this there are primary dealers also primary dealers are the ones who help uh, you know who help uh, execute positions for for the central bank for bonds so primary dealers are the dealers with whom central banks trade when conducting monetary policy they act as intermediary between large clients and the central banks so let's say the central bank of the country decides that they want to you know offload uh, 100 million dollar of treasury bills so these primary dealers will take the position and they will they will try to sell these 100 million securities to various clients or corporates or financial institutions so for example if 
US governments or US Federal Bank decides that we want to sell 100 million of security. So US Fed would call up the clients and do that. US Fed will send this 100 million treasury bills to US banks. Let's say Goldman Sachs or uh, you know Morgan Stanley or Citibank takes uh, you know around 25 to 30 billion uh, 30 million dollar of that chunk. Right now, what they will do that they will find pension funds, insurance companies, other banks, and large corporates, and they will try to sell them by adding some margin. Got my point? So they may charge some margin or they may charge some spread, and that's how they will make money. Clear? So primary dealers are the ones who help the central bank raise capital. Clear? Everyone? Any doubts? Any questions? Anyone? Securitization or securitizers. These are the organizations uh, way which which will what they will do. They will collect the. We we have an entire topic on fixed income by the way securitization. So I'll I'll be discussing at length there. But however, just to give you a small and quick understanding of what securitization is, uh, let's say there is a financial institution, a bank, uh, or, or an NBFC, non-banking financial corporation. What it does is that it gives loans to various people, right? What types of loans does it give? Come on, quick. Everyone, what types of loans a bank gives? Personal loan. Personal loan, home loan. Home loan. Loans, credit card, education loan, car loan, right? So various types of loans they have in their books. Now, what they do that, let's say they have a book of $100 million of loans. Now, they will offload this $100 million loan, transfer it to a special purpose vehicle, transfer it to a separate company. And from that company, they will create different bonds of these securities and then they will sell it to investment banks. Now, these investment banks then will sell it to investors. So by making a pool of your loan portfolio and transferring it to the SPV, and eventually selling it to the investor. This is called securitization, right? I am trying to explain that in the shortest way possible. But, but through this, what happens? The bank has offloaded its you know, assets from its, uh, from its portfolio and sold it to the investors. So banks get immediate liquidity. That financial institution gets immediate money. Rather than waiting for 10 and 20 years for the borrowers to pay, I've sold that to the investors. This process is called securitization. Got it, everyone? Clear? So the biggest advantage that a financial institution gets through securitization is that they get immediate capital, right? They don't have to wait for the borrowers to pay. They just sold it to investors. Clear? This is uh, you know, equally riskier also because if the borrowers default, then the investors will not be able to get their money. Correct. For this, they create a special company, which is called as SPV, special purpose vehicle or special purpose entity. Clear everyone. Right. If there is a threat that the, uh, that the securitized papers will default, then you can, then you can take a CDS. A CDS is a protection, protection against default in the bond. So by taking a CDS, basically you ensure you are insured. That if the papers, if the securitized papers get default, if the borrowers don't pay, then you can get uh, that reimbursed from the insurance company. That is, you can club your securitization investments. If you are an investment company, you can club your securitized papers with the CDS. So you are protected. Clear, everyone? Yes. Those are the, the people who help you deal with this. They are called securitizers. Mostly investment bankers are the one who help create all this. So they are, they are not a separate entity. Securitizers are nothing but the investment bankers itself. Then you have depository institutions and financial corporations. Depository institutions are nothing but banks. They collect deposit from you, and in return, they give you some. They give you some rate of deposits, right? Uh, they apart from this, banks also give you other services like transaction services and short term and long term credit. Clear? So, depository institutions mean nothing but it means a bank. Insurance companies, they, they help you protect uh, and uh, they protect you from liabilities, protect you from loss of your assets and various other protections, right? But they charge a fee for, for it. So basically, if you have any risk, your risk will be protected, but at a cost of fee. 
So insurance is nothing but it's actually transfer of risk from the guy who is insured to the insurance company, right? Now, after this, uh, you know, if you want to do insurance in financial markets, you can use derivatives also. Derivatives can be used for your insurance. When you use derivatives for insurance, we call that as hedging. Okay. Arbitrators. Arbitrators are the ones who take positions in the market when they, they when they find difference in the price of similar assets. Right. For example, let's say I find a value of dollar in bank A at 50 and I find the value of dollar in bank B at 51. What will I do? I will buy from bank A and immediately sell to bank B and I will make a gain of $1. This is called arbitrage. Arbitrage is when you earn risk free profit, risk free profit because the value of the same asset is different in different markets. But what is the concept of arbitrage based on? It is based on the law of one price that if, if it's the same dollar, why should its value be different in bank A and bank B? It should be same, right? So arbitrages are the ones who try to tap the difference of the asset price in two different markets if they are different. Arbitrage has the cause, uh, uh, has the effect of causing prices in different markets to converge. How can they converge? Well, if more and more people buy from bank A, which is right now at 50 for a dollar, the price will increase. And the more people try to sell in bank B, which is at 51. So more people try to sell, the price will decrease. So bank A's price will increase, bank B's price will decrease. Eventually they'll meet. So arbitrage is only possible till the point there is a price difference. And once there is a price difference, too many arbitrages will enter in with huge volume and they will eventually converge the price or keep it separate. Converse. They will converge the price. So having arbitrages is good in the market because they will they will ensure that there is no price disparity. Correct. Then finally, you have uh, those institutions uh, which helps you clear your transactions. So when I am transacting for a security, if I want to buy and sell a security, I do that with a broker. But a but a system, a mechanism which helps me execute this. That is called a clearing house. A clearing house is a financial institution that provides clearing and settlement services for financial and commodities, for derivatives and various other securities. They help avoid counterparty risk. So when I am transferring one thing, let's say I'm transferring money from my bank to your bank. If I'm transferring security from my account to your account, which is the DMAT securities, right? Those are insured or guaranteed because that clearing and settlement is done by specialized institutions. We call them clearing and settlement companies, right? They are the ones who help us execute this. Therefore, there is no counterparty risk while clearing, right? You don't have to be worried that when I sell or buy securities, it won't get lost in the transit because the clearing settlement companies take the responsibility. Then when you actually buy the securities and when you hold them, like, like you, when you have cash, you hold them, uh, you know, who holds your cash on your behalf, the bank. Similarly, when you buy securities and when you hold them, there are custodians which hold or depositories which hold your securities. It's like bank holding your money in the similar way, the custodians or the depositories will hold your securities. They will, they will protect or they will store your securities for which they may charge you custodian fees and all. Clear everyone? So these are various types of financial intermediaries, brokers, block brokers, dealers, exchange, investment bankers, securitizers, which are also like investment bankers, insurance companies. Then you have arbitrages and clearing houses and custodians. So various types of uh, financial intermediaries, which are a part of the financial system, everyone. So financial system, financial markets, financial instruments, and financial intermediaries. Everyone clear with this? Anyone, any doubts? Right, very easy. Now, with all this ecosystem at place, how does someone actually execute a trade? Well, in order to execute a trade, you have to take a position. So now we are going ahead and dealing with a very interesting thing is what are the different types of financial position? Well, there are two famous positions which we all know, long and short. Long means long in financial markets we call long and short instead of buy and sell 
Long means everyone. Come on. Buy position. Buy. Buying an asset, right? Why do you buy an asset? Because you feel the prices will increase. Increase. That is where you say you are bullish. Okay. Except, except options. Options are very different. Except options. All other instruments, you can say you are taking a long position because you expect the markets to be bullish. You expect the prices to be increasing. You expect the interest rates to go up or whatsoever. So whenever you expect the things to rise, you take a long positions, right? Everyone. Similarly, what is a short position? A short position is ideally, uh, basically I'm, you're focusing on short selling. Now, remember, let's say there is a property. So you, you first buy a property with the intention that the prices will go up and then you sell, right? Yes. Correct. But what if you think that the property is overvalued and you don't have the property? What do you think? Normally, what do we do if the property prices are overvalued? And if you don't have the property, what would you do? Would you buy it? No. 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 But you wait for the property prices to come down and then you buy it, right? Yes. Yes. However, what if you had a choice to sell it now and buy it later? Well, that's not allowed in real estate. However, welcome to financial markets. In financial markets, you can sell something even before buying. And that is called short selling. Everyone. So what is short selling? Short selling is a situation where you sell something even before buying. However, with the commitment that you will buy it back later at some point of time. So your position is not closed until you buy it back. By the way, you buy now and sell later because you expect markets to be Increase. bullish. bullish. Similar way, you, you are selling something now and you will buy later because you expect the price to fall or you expect the markets to be bearish. bearish. Clear. So in financial markets, short selling is allowed where you can sell now and buy it later. Clear everyone. However, remember uh, how you can exactly do this is a very interesting thing. So let's understand the steps. Very, very important. Okay. So first thing that you have to do guys is that in order to sell something, I should have it. If I don't have it, I will have to borrow it. So very important is the first step here. The first step here is that let's, th let's say you think that the Tesla stock is overpriced. So what would you do? You will have to borrow the stock from someone else. Let's say you have to borrow the stock from a broker. Broker has a holding. So you'll borrow the stock from the broker, let's say for one month. You'll borrow for one month now and you will sell it. Okay. You will sell it. And let's say that today's the price is thousand dollars. So today I will sell it at thousand dollars because I feel the price will go down. So at thousand dollars, I will sell it. Let's say for with the, for one month. So after a month, I will buy it back. Now that is the first thing I will borrow and then I will sell it. The short seller then hands over the stock to the broker. So I sold it, right? I, I'm of course going to sell it to do the book, broker itself. Now, why am I give, going to give it to the broker? Because the broker will keep that as a security, as a collateral. The broker keeps the sales proceeds as a margin. So I have sold the share for $1,000. But this $1,000 is with the broker. I don't get the $1,000 immediately. Otherwise, I'll run away. Right. So that thousand dollar is with the broker. Why? Because I have to, at a point in time in future, I have to also buy it back. Correct. So the broker keeps this thousand dollar with the broker keeps this thousand dollar. Everyone. Now, what should ideally the broker can do with this thousand dollar? Well, the broker can keep it idle or the broker can deposit it. Right. If the broker deposits this, the broker gets some interest. So, so the broker can earn interest on the margin which is called a short rebate and it is then shared with the short seller. Let's say the broker makes $2 on this. So broker can share some of this margin with the short seller. Now you had first sold the stock. Now, if the stock, if, if the stock after the short sale goes down, good thing for you or bad thing. 
you are expecting you are doing short selling because you expected markets to be bearish down bearish so if the market goes down let's say after a month the stock price becomes uh, let's say nine hundred dollars so basically what you will do you will now buy it back correct with the help of the broker and the broker will give you the difference of that hundred dollar however the broker has to pay interest to to the one who lend the stocks right so the broker must have also arranged the stock from somewhere clear so how will it work well first of all the short seller will square off his position or her position how will they square off they had first sold it now the when the prices went down they will buy it back and the shares are given back to the lender along with the borrowing cost clear so let's say the borrowing cost is five dollar so eventually how much will i get i will get hundred dollar minus five dollar assuming there is no rebate no no interest on so i will eventually get how much the difference minus the five dollar which i have to pay to the lender clear However, contrary, the share prices do rise instead of thousand dollar. What if they become eleven hundred dollars? In that case, in that case, my loss will be hundred dollars plus five. I'll have to pay hundred and five to the to the lender. Clear, everyone? Right. So this is how I will sell the security even without I having it. I I temporarily just buy it, or or I can say not buy. I temporarily borrow it. however during this period if the company declares any dividends those dividends don't belong to me they belong to the original owner which is the lender so all the dividends are paid on the stock uh, they belong to the lender and they have to be reimbursed back to the lender clear everyone because i am not the original owner i just borrowed the security everyone clear everyone yes sir steps so two major steps uh, two major position that we take long position and short position short position is nothing but short selling right now comes an interesting position which we generally take in derivatives that is called leveraged position what do you mean by leveraged position hedge ha huh? sorry hedge position no no not hedge position leveraged you are taking borrowings leverage position is a position where you are going to take borrowings so in derivatives you don't put in your own you, you don't put your entire money correct you borrow it from the uh, your your broker funds you clear so in derivatives basically let's say if i am trading in futures so i am going to uh, take a position for Thousand dollar, but I don't have to pay thousand dollar. I may have to pay only ten percent of it right now as deposits. So the rest ninety percent is being funded by the by the broker. The broker, and that's why we call that as a leveraged position. Leveraged position is where you take leverage. You don't put in your entire money. You are basically taking the help of the broker, the broker who funds your position. You are taking borrowings from the broker. Of course, the broker will charge interest for it. now leverage position leverage position or leverage transactions are the, those where the investor purchases the stocks by borrowing a part of money from their brokers now this part can range depending on how much the broker is willing to fund you the borrowed money is called margin loan and the brokers charge the brokers will charge investor some rate of interest right normally this rate of interest is slightly higher than you can say the t bills or the risk free security right now this interest which the broker is going to charge you for the money that the broker is funding that is called call money rate so margin loan is the loan given by the broker on your position clear and the interest that the broker charges on this is called is called what call money rate everyone clear yes the stock is kept as collateral with the broker and the traders equity now what is traders equity let's say i told you that out of 100 dollars if i put in only 10 dollars then 90 dollars is funded by the broker so my traders equity is nothing but my position my amount or my contribution in the total position that is called traders equity traders equity is the amount which is paid by the investor or by the uh, you know also called 
uh, basically the amount that that uh, here the trader puts uh, basically his own money clear traders who buy securities on margin are subject to minimum margin requirements very important that's what we are going to learn minimum margin requirements is basically the minimum deposit money that you have to maintain it's a minimum balance that you have to maintain why why you have to maintain because the balance value can keep on reducing what if your share prices start falling right the balance that you had given may start depleting so you have to maintain some minimum balance that is called minimum margin requirement clear so do i pay the entire money no i just pay an initial deposit that is called initial margin so what are the margin requirements first initial margin initial margin is the minimum fraction of the purchase that you have to deposit you basically means the investor the investor has to deposit with the broker now who sets this initial margin this initial margin is set by the government or the regulators or the exchange or the brokers can decide clear the brokers can charge initial margin someone to for someone as 10 percentage for someone as 20 percentage depending on the credit risk of the investors buyers on the st of, of stock on margin uh sorry buying stocks on margin increases the investment's risk and return both because if if your value increases you make more money on small amount of investment but if your value decreases you may lose everything and you have also taken a, a liability by taking uh, you know the, le uh, the leverage so leverage or debt generally magnifies your gains and loss which we will see so initial margin is the initial deposit everyone clear initial deposit means the initial amount that you have to deposit with the broker correct but that value will keep on changing why because the because of the in the market because of the market the share prices are not constant right so your your balance will also keep on changing every day and therefore you will have to maintain some minimum amount before before the investor becomes bankrupt or before the investors default because the markets are very volatile so that minimum amount that you have to maintain in the deposit account is called maintenance margin requirement it is a minimum equity which has to be maintained with the broker at any given point of time during the life of the leverage trade right however if if the balance goes below the if it comes to the point of maintenance margin then the broker will call you up to get additional funds that is called margin call so when would you get a margin call when your balance drops below initial margin requirement not initial margin maintenance, maintenance margin. margin maintenance margin your balance drops below maintenance margin. maintenance margin okay so let's see that first of all let's deal with leverage ratio leverage ratio means how much times you have taken the leverage for example i've said here that i paid 400 dollars and the broker is offering me 2.5 times leverage it means for my 400 dollars how much times do i get to take the position 2.5 times so that is 400 into 2.5 i am taking a position of 1000 dollars so guys out of 1000 dollars how much is the trader's equity 400 40 percentage i can say right how do i get 40 percentage everyone 40 percentage i from the total position what is the trader's equity invested from that is how I get 40 percentage here. The leverage that they had given me was 2.5 times. Everyone leverage was 2.5 times and the traders equity year was 40 percentage. Correct. So what is leverage ratio? Leverage ratio is nothing but one over traders equity, one over traders equity. For example, here in this example, how much was traders equity? I said was 40 percentage. Correct. So one divided by 40 percentage. I will get 2.5 times leverage clear in the same way let's say if the traders equity is 10 percentage so i will do one divide by 10 percentage i will get leverage of 10 times leverage is always in times it means based on the money that i put in how much times position i can take so if the traders equity is 50 percentage i will do one divide by 50 percentage I will get leverage of two times. And if it is 5%, I will do one divide by just 5%. I will get 20 times leverage. So the lower the trader's equity, guys, the lower the trader's equity, the more is your leverage. Clear, everyone? 
So in questions, you will be either given leverage ratio through you through which you find the trader's equity, or you'll be given trader's equity to find the leverage. Clear? Why is this useful, by the way? This is useful to understand two things. How much you have invested and on what basis you will get a margin call. The second important thing here is that when you're going to calculate returns for the investors, are you going to take your investment year 1000 in this example or 400? 400. Everyone, 1000 or 400? 400. 400. Why? Because you have put in only 400. The remaining amount is funded by the broker for which you're going to pay the interest also. So whenever you will calculate return on investment, your return on, on investment is not going to be on the total position amount that you have taken, but on the equity position, on your contribution. Clear everyone? Remember this. Now, your, the maximum leverage that you get, the maximum amount of leverage you get is dependent on the minimum margin requirement. Let's say the minimum margin that you have to maintain is 10 percentage. So one divided by 10 percentage, 10 times is the leverage that you can take maximum. You can't take a leverage beyond that. So maximum leverage ratio is nothing but one divided by the minimum margin requirement. So the lower the minimum margin requirement, the greater the leverage you get. Clear? And then the, we will see one formula here. I don't want you to uh, recognize or Remember the formula now. We'll see this later on how to derive it. But call price. What is call price? Call price is the price at which you will get a call for additional deposit. Are you getting me? Why? Because this is the price at which your, your account balance has reached the below reach, minimum, below minimum reach to the point maintenance, of margin. maintenance margin. So this is the share price at which you may get a call for margins. And if your share price drops below this, and if you have not paid margin, what will happen? Position will square off. The position will be squared off by the broker. Your account may be closed by the broker and they may also charge you penalty if you don't pay the margins. Clear? Initially, the brokers used to do manually this. These days you have financial system where the system itself, the risk management system itself will auto square off your position. What do you mean by auto square off? Where the system itself will sell off your share if you have not deposited the funds within the stipulated time so that price at which the price at which you will get a margin call that price is called call price clear everyone we are going to uh, we are going to calculate all of that now so let's deal with that so let's take multiple examples where we will be calculating this let's do it step by step so your margin calculation a trader believes that the price of Exxon Mobil, Exxon Mobil, world's largest oil and gas company before Saudi Aramco was listed. A trader believes that Exxon Mobil stock will go up in the near future. Well, if the prices are going to up, go up, what is the position that you will take? Long position. Long position, you'll buy. And decides to buy 100 shares at the current market price of $70. The initial margin requirement is, guys, 40%. So, by the way, what is going to be the contract? value i'm going to buy 100 shares at the price of 70 correct so i can say my contract value is 7000 but out of that 7000 they have said that the initial margin is 40 percentage so how much will be my contribution guys 2800 yes i will do 7000 is the total contract value multiplied with 40 percentage so my contribution is going to be 2800 the maintenance margin requirement is 30%. So out of this 7,000, the minimum that I will have to maintain is 30%. That is 2,100 is what I have to keep balance at any point of time, everyone. How much cash will the trader need to contribute? We've said that your the initial margin is 2,800. So that's the cash the uh, trader will have to contribute, right? Can someone tell me what is the leverage ratio here? Everyone, they have not asked me, but my leverage ratio is 60. one over the trader's equity, which is how much? One divided by four. How much is the trader's contribution? One by four, one divided by 
40 percentage. So I get 2.5 times leverage. Got it? So by paying 2800, I get to take a position of five times. That is 7000. Clear everyone. Right, everyone? Yes, sir. Uh, 2800, I take, uh, get to take the position of 2.5 times. That is 7000. Clear everyone? Any questions, anyone? So here, based on your minimum margin, you get to know your maximum leverage ratio. So what if here in the example two, the minimum margin requirement is 25%. If the minimum margin requires 25%, can you tell me what is the maximum, maximum 75. leverage? One divided by 25%. I'll get four times. I can say four times is the maximum leverage I have. Got it? So maximum leverage ratio is nothing but one minus the minimum margin requirement. Clear? So the maximum leverage I can take is four times. Everyone with me on this? Clear? Yes. Now let's deal with a proper uh, example of an investor where we will take into account his buying and selling prices take the leverage uh, and also, you know, we will now consider uh, what if the broker charges me interest. They are definitely going to charge me interest for the duration that I take the margins, right? Let's deal with that. And now one of you can help me and I will accordingly uh, do it, right? So anyone would want to take the opportunity to solve this 3A? I will help you in between, but you will have to contribute the data. Anyone would like to take the opportunity? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Trader has purchased 50 shares of the firm on a mm -hmm. margin at a price of 20%. Okay. So 50 shares of a firm on margin at a price of 20. So 50 and 20, what does it give you? Uh, trader's equity. No, 50 times 20 will give you the contract value. Are you getting it? So 50 times 20 it will give you the total contract value thousand dollars right the trader is taking a position in 50 shares which are of 20 dollars so basically the contract value is thousand dollars got it yes sir go ahead the leverage ratio is 2.5 times okay so the leverage ratio they have given me is 2.5 times what do i get with leverage ratio if i do one over the leverage leverage ratio i will get traders equity traders equity which is 40 percentage so 40 percentage, 40 percent is the trader's equity. So can I say here, the trader's contribution is 1000 into 40 percentage. So the trader's contribution is $400. Yes, and I can say out of the remaining will be the leverage, the borrowings that I will take. 600 will be my borrowing. Everyone clear? Yes. Go ahead. Three months later, the trader sells this shares at rupees $22 per share. At $22 per share, not rupees. <laughs> the firm yeah. did not pay any dividend during the period. Correct. So they did not pay any dividend. So at what price did you buy the share? $20. $20. And you sold the share at $22. So your gain will be $22 $20. minus $20 on how many shares? 50 shares. 50 shares. That's your gain, $100. Correct. Ignoring the interest paid on the borrowed amount and transaction costs, what was the return to the trader during the three month period? What is the investor's return due to leverage? First of all, how much is the return? We got hundred dollars. Correct. Yes. But now tell me the returns on his investment. How much was his investment? Four hundred dollars. Yes, four hundred dollars. So I my returns will be hundred on an investment of. 400. Are you getting it? So basically I made 25 percentage return in a three month period. Remember here in the denominator, I have put the money, which I had put in on day one. I had put only $400 on day one. Correct. The remaining 600 was funded by the broker. If they had given me interest, interest on this 600, then I would subtract that from the gain. Are you getting it? Yes. So my gain would be reduced by the amount of interest that I had to pay on the borrowed money. Clear everyone? Simple everyone? 
Yes, now, step by step, I'll increase some complexities. Everyone. So you remember one thing: the return is always on the on the trader's equity, not on the position, right? So, everyone. Now let's see how things change. So in three B, anyone would want to try three B? Everyone clear with first three A? Part B, right? Yeah, yeah. What is the no, no, it's, it's an, uh, what is the investor's return due to leverage? Well, this 25% is because of the leverage itself. So they said part A that what is the gain? Basically, your gain is $100 only on the total position. However, their returns are always due to leverage because we are not going to calculate the return on the investment. The return on the investment is your $400 only. So there's no difference here. Basically, when they say this, you have to calculate the returns on your investment that is on traders equity. Okay. No, nothing is left here. Don't worry. Everyone clear. And the best thing for you is that in exams, you're going to be given choices. So you don't have to present all this thing. You can simply just do it in the rough and calculate. Right. One thing I did not do here is that I did not involve the commissions or I did not involve the brokerage. Let's deal with that. So now we are going to calculate returns with leverage and with commissions or with brokerage. Okay. Anyone would want to read this? And I, write. I can read. Go ahead. And just keep on telling me the data so that I'll input it. Yeah. Go ahead. An investor purchases 1,000 shares of a company at $1.25. Okay. So what does this give you? This um, is a contract value. Contract 1,000 into 25. Correct. Yes. With leverage ratio of three. Leverage ratio of three. So three times. So three times is your leverage ratio. So three times. What do I get from that? Traders equity. If I do one over three, I get traders equity. Correct? Yes. So traders equity 0. 0.33 into 25,000. 25,000. So you can simply say 8332.5 and the remaining will be your leverage, isn't it? Yes. Or remaining will be your borrowings. So 16667.5. Clear everyone? So my investment is 8332.5. Go ahead. Next. And then sells them after one year at $1.35. Okay. Uh, the commission paid is 0 0.05 per share. Per share. How many shares you have? Thousand. Thousand. So what is your total commission? Fifty dollars. Fifty. Fifty, right? Basically, thousand shares, and they have said me the commission is zero point zero five for every share. So fifty dollar is the commission. Commission. But. Remember, you always pay the commission by buying and while selling. So if they have not mentioned, you have to consider it as same for buying and same for selling. Everyone with me on this. Mm -hmm. So without even them mentioning, I will put the same money for buying as well as selling. So I have to pay the commission twice. So can you tell me the first 50 is what I'm going to pay when? At the start. Start buying. Yeah. Right? So, what will be my initial investment? Can someone tell me? It, it's just the. Is it only the trader's equity? Plus commission. Plus the commission. How much commission? Fifty dollars. Fifty. Fifty dollars. Very important. So your investment, initial investment, is I can say eight three three two point five. Plus the $50 which you paid at the start, not at the end, because that $50 will be subtracted from your final position. Are you getting my point? Yes. Clear. So you don't initially, how much you had put, you had put your trader's equity and the commission at that time. Clear? Remember this very impo important thing. Right. What is the next thing? Money market is 5%. Money market yield, this is going to be on the on the borrowed money. Borrowing. So how much have you borrowed? 25,000. 
Correct. Sixteen thousand six sixty-seven point five is what you borrowed, and on that, this guy is going to charge you five percentage. But have they told you for how much period? They have said find the investors return for the year. So it's year. year so I'll take entire five percentage. Had it been for six months, I would have to take six by twelve. Six by twelve. Yes. Very important. Okay. So my interest here is 833.375. Everyone? Clear? Everyone? Yes. Sir. Right? Yes. So now, what is my capital gain? What is the difference in the share price here, by the way? In dollars. My difference was between 35 and 25 on how many shares? On thousand shares, so I had a capital gain of ten thousand. However, if I now see the net gain, what all things I have to subtract from it? Well, I have to subtract the commissions both the times and interest also. So eventually, I'll get only nine zero six six point six two five. Everyone with me? Yes. This is the net amount I will receive. On my initial investment, how much was my initial investment? We already calculated that. Everyone with me? Clear? So my returns are going to be this, sorry. This. Yeah. Oh, what is this? This is 108.16 percentage. Just check it if it's correct. 108 percentage. Everyone. Clear? You got a return of 9,000 on your investment of less than 9,000. Why is that so? Because of leverage. Remember leverage, because of leverage, it is possible to have magnifying gains and even losses. Everyone cleared with this? Any questions, anyone? What were the two important things here? First, you assumed about the commission at the start as well as at the end. And second important thing was that your initial investment considers only the initial commission, not the commission at the end. Are you getting my point, everyone? Yes, sir. That is very, very important. So your what we have taken in our initial investment is only the first commission, not the second commission. Clear? These are the types of questions that you'll be dealing up in exams. Okay. Easy, manageable. Any questions? Anyone? I don't be surprised with the answer here. A lot of students have come and told me that, sir, how can this be 108%? Well, it can be. So don't doubt your calculator or your answers. Let the answer be whatever it is. It is possible when you take leverage, your returns can be exponentially higher. Clear, everyone? Now, in the same manner, can you completely solve this 3C, everyone? I, uh, I will put this question on your screen here. Take your time and solve it yourself. Okay. And I will give you all two to three minutes and we'll discuss after that. Is it visible everyone? Clearly? Everyone? Yes. Okay. So take your time. I'm just zooming in. Take your time. Solve it. And let's, uh, you know, I, I'll give you two to three minutes. I'll pause it here. I'll uh, give you two to three minutes. Solve it. And then we'll discuss what is your answer. Everyone, right? So take your time. Okay, so I hope you all have solved it. Let me know your answers. <clears throat> what is the contract value first? 300 shares at 30. Correct? 9,000. The leverage ratio. They said the stock is bought at 50% margin. 
So I will do one divide by 50%. I think two. the average is two times, correct? So your equity year out of 9,000, your equity year is also 50%. Clear? And same is your leverage, isn't it? What else? One month later, one month later, he received a dividend of 0 0.25 per share. After, after receiving the dividend, he immediately sold the shares at 28.5 per share. So what is the gain or loss here? Anyone? No one with answer? Little gain, minus 450. Yeah, minus 450. How do you get that? 28.5 minus 30 on how many shares you have? 300 shares. So your loss is minus 450, but you got a dividend of 0 0.25 per share. So 0 0.25 into 300. Everyone, right? Yes. What about the commission? Very interesting. He paid commission of 5 on purchase and 4.5 on sale. So what is the total commission? 5 plus 4.5. 9.5 into 300 or only 9.5? I'm sure many must have done a mistake of multiplying that with 300. Anyone done that? No one? Yes. Yes, sir. You all have multiplied that with 300, right? Yes. Why? Just see the difference in the previous question. It was said 0 0.05 per share. Here, I did not say 0 0.05 per share. It just said that pound 5 on purchase and pound 4.5. I did not say. Plus, also think logically. If you had multiplied with 300, your brokerage would have been more than, uh, you know, the value of your investment or capital gains altogether. Are you getting it? So, that was even logically not possible. Clear. So, you have to be careful. How much is the interest? Have they told any? Yeah, they have told uh, one month later borrowed at 1% per month. So what should be my interest here? Anyone? 45 pounds. How much my position is for one month period? So 4,500 times one percentage. It's going to be 45. Everyone. So tell me the net gain. Minus 450 plus 75 minus 9.5. Am I correct? And minus 45. Is everyone getting 429.5? So your return is going to be 429.5 negative on your investment. Anyone can tell me your investment. How much is it? 4505. 4,500 plus initial initial commission that is they had said is 5 at the purchase. Are you getting it? So you will get here, you can say here as negative 9.53 percentage. Clear everyone? So I can simply say this is going to be minus 9.53 percent, which is my returns. Everyone cleared. What was the interesting thing about the commission? Remember here, I did not mention per share. That was a total commission here, right? Also, you had to see it mathematically, was it possible? Clear? And the interest was for one month and basically your net gain here was actually your loss. Everyone? Right? Clear. Should I move to the next question? Everyone understood their so, mistakes, if any? Yeah, go ahead. Ask me. So the interest was for one month. One month. So, they, they, that specifically mentioned because the position was for one month. So they had meant, they had clearly told me that the rate of 1% per month. Had they not told me this, we always take the interest as annualized. Okay. They had specifically told me 1% per month. 
had they told me that the interest rate is three percentage and not said me anything, then I would do three percentage into one by twelve. Clear? Okay. And the question would be what what would be the return for one month period? Yeah, yeah. So see, both okay. are different. Interest rates information is always assumed to be yearly until not mentioned. Okay. So you will readjust it based on the position period. If your position is for two months, then you will have to take interest two by twelve, unless and until they mention that the two month interest is two percent. Got it? So you have to carefully watch their words. Okay, don't worry. They they won't confuse you. In CFA exams, they won't put you up in a fix. They, my experience is that they very clearly mention things. Okay. So now quickly, everyone will help me with the three D part. Investor bought hundred shares at fifty. So I will say hundred into fifty is going to be my position. Initial margin of sixty percentage. So five thousand into sixty percentage will be my initial margin. So what is going to be my leverage? If three thousand I paid from my pocket, how much? Two thousand. Two thousand. Yeah, leverage amount. If in case if you want to bring it in amount, yes, you can say five thousand minus three thousand. You can say in amount terms, it's two thousand. You don't have to show the leverage in times. Don't worry. Uh, they have said that the dividend received one dollar per share. So I will put the dividend as one into how many shares we had here? Fifty. Hundred. Hundred. Sorry, hundred shares. Hmm. Commission paid zero point one per share. Yes. So my commission will be zero point one into fifty. But. Oh, uh, sorry. Into hundred. Hundred. But only once or twice. 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 So I will do into two. For buying and selling both, clear. So ten dollars at the start and ten dollars at the end. Remember this. Interest, interest is. Uh, uh, they have said that the call money rate is now five percent. That's it. They have not said anything. But find the investor's total return if he sold the share at sixty dollar after a year. So basically, your interest is for one year. On how much amount? Two thousand dollars. Two thousand into. Into into five percentage, so my interest is hundred dollar. My capital gain fifty and sixty, so I will do sixty minus fifty on on hundred shares. So my net gain will be one thousand plus hundred minus twenty and minus hundred. Am I correct? Nine eighty, everyone. Nine eighty on investment of anyone. Three thousand and ten. Yes, three thousand plus the initial plus of ten. Ten. So I will get an answer of thirty two point five six percentage here. That's my return on investment. Clear, everyone. Yes. Easy. So just do it step by step. Don't be in a hurry. The reason I've presented it this way is that you have the habit of writing everything, even if in exam you want to do it quickly. So don't rush here. Take it step by step. Okay. Everyone cleared. Now. We did understand about call price. What is call price, by the way? It is a price of share at which you will get a call from you get a margin call. call. And why do you get a margin call? Because your initial balance, initial margin has reached the point of maintenance maintenance, maintenance margin. Okay. So see this now. The current price of J.P. Morgan Chase is sixty-eight dollar per share. You have eight one six zero to invest. You borrow an additional five four four zero. So, guys, how much have you invested? Eight one six zero. 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 Eight one six zero.
is your borrowing. 13, so, yeah, sorry, go ahead. You were saying something? Yeah. The total amount investment. Total investment is, I will say the total investment is, I can say 8160 plus 5440. My total investment is 13,600. And out of that, what is going to be my initial margin? I have 8160. So I will put 8160 out of 13600. Correct? So I can say my initial margin is 60 percentage, everyone. Yes. Clear? And they have said if the maintenance margin is 40 percentage. So guys, my maintenance margin my maintenance margin is 40%. So I'll write your maintenance margin. Okay. 40 percentage means how much I have to minimum maintain. I have to at any point of time, sorry, I'll just erase it. At any point of time, I have to maintain how much minimum? 40% is what I have to maintain. Clear? Now what will happen ideally, the share prices will keep on changing. So my margins will also keep on changing, but I have to not lose more than 40% at any point of time. Now there is a direct formula to calculate this, which is current market price into one minus initial margin over maintenance, one minus maintenance margin. That shortcut is there, but I would want to show you that how exactly this is done. So I will try to show you if possible through, through a spreadsheet and Basically, in the spreadsheet, I have already put the figures there. So just let me share you my screen. Yeah. Let me know once you can see my screen, everyone. Yes. Okay. So see here, the contract value was 13,600. Out of that, 60% was my contribution. 40% is minimum that I have to maintain. So at the start, I had to maintain 5,440. Clear? That's what they had told. Now, the share price was 68 and the contract value was 13,600. So basically, in that way, I can say I had 200 shares in the contract, right? Yes. If you do 13,600 divided by 68 at the start point, can I say you had 200 shares? Clear? And how much did the balance you put? Everyone cleared or not? 200 shares. You want me to show that everyone? 13,600 was your total position at the start and the share price was 68. If you divide that, you get 200 shares. Everyone? Yes. The balance that I had put initially was 8160 and my margin percentage. How do I get the margin percentage? This is 8160 divided by the contract value. That is 60 percentage. Now, I've placed up the formula here. And let's see any, if I put any price. When will I get the call, by the way? When the position is going down or when the position is going up? Down. Down. Position is going down. So let's now take a price. Let me take your price at 65. At 65, what will be my contract? 65 into 200. So I will get 13,000. When the price becomes 13,000, guys, if you notice here, there is a loss of 600 from the previous position. This is called mark to market. How much is the loss from the previous position? 600. That's called mark to market, mark to market M to M. Mark to market is daily marking of unrealized gain or loss. Why do I say unrealized? Because you have not actually sold. You are just seeing what is the potential loss if I square off today. Potential loss if you square off today. Clear? So due to this, my balance is re reduced from 8160. What is my new balance? 7560. How much is 7560 of 13,000? That is 58.15. So the balance has slightly gone down. Yes. But has it gone to 40% yet? No. 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 So I will not get a margin call. Now let's take another price. Let's take 60. Okay, my mark to market loss is 1000 and my balance is 6560. Still, it is not 40. Okay, let me take 50. What happens at 50? Will I get a margin call at 50? No. 
No, why? Because it has not reached 40 percentage. Let me put 45. Oh, will I get a margin call at 45? Yes. 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 Somewhere around 45, I can say actually 45 is already breached. So I can say, let me see 45.5. What happens at 45.5? 45.5. It is 40.22 slightly. So can I say somewhere between 45 and 40, uh, 45.5, somewhere between that, I'll get a margin call. Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. So now how do I exactly find that? That's where we have a shortcut. So let me show you the shortcut there. Uh, and the shortcut that we have, the shortcut formula that we have is this the call price is current market price into one minus initial margin divided by one minus maintenance margin so the call price here is current market price which is 68 into one minus initial margin how much is the initial margin guys initial margin is 60 percentage right 60%. so one minus 0 0.6 divided by one minus the maintenance margin 0 0.4 that's the shortcut you are available with so you get a price of 45.33 remember we just saw on the spreadsheet the call price was somewhere between 45 and 45.5 right yes. so now if i put here 45.33 what i get is an exact 40 percentage clear everyone so if your share price goes from 68 to 45.33, that is the point at which you'll get a margin call. Everyone with me on this? Clear? Right? Because if I take 45.32 also, it will breach that 40%. It will go below that. So, at 45.33 itself, I'll get a margin call. If I don't pay the money at that point, what will happen, guys? My position will get square off. Clear, everyone? So I've showed you how it works on a spreadsheet. But in exam, if you directly want to put up the calculation, you can directly show it by this shortcut formula. Everyone with me on this. Clear? So this call price is the price at which? You get the margin call. Everyone clear? Everyone understood it in the spreadsheet also? How it works? Right? So you can create your own spreadsheet. Here I will say price, number of shares. I got the contract value. Mark to market is daily settlement gain or loss. Unrealized gain or loss settlement. Then based on that, what will be your revised balance? And how much is that money, your balance? of margin based on your contract value. That is called percentage of your initial margin. And that should not drop at any time below 40%. Clear everyone. So that price at which your share price at which you will get a margin call that is called call price. Everyone cleared with this calculation? Any questions, anyone? Anyone, any questions? Well, that's the calculation of margins. And that's a major type of calculation that you have in this uh, reading. Now we go on understanding uh, on a quick basis on understanding what are the different types of orders. So positions, you take long position, short position, or which position we understood now? Leverage positions, am I correct? Everyone, but when you want to take positions, you have to give some instructions to the broker or to the exchange, isn't it? Those instructions are called different types of orders. Now, those instructions can be how to fill in the order, which are called execu execution instructions. Then when exactly to put the order, those are called validity instructions and how to arrange or settle. They are called clearing instructions. 
So three type of instructions goes in when you want to trade or when you want to take a position. What are the three types of instructions? Execution instructions. They tell you how do you want to buy or sell. Then you have validity instructions. They will tell you when the order is filled. And then you have clearing instructions. They tell you how the order will be settled. Clear everyone? Yes. So I want to show you this screen here. This is a typical screen which tells you the bid and the offers or also called as ask. What is the bid by the way? Bid is called the price at which we buy from the market. At which we will buy from the market. The customer will buy and ask is the price at which the seller is willing to sell. Correct? Yes. So bid are the prices put by buyers or sellers? Buyers. Buyers. And offer or ask are the prices put by the Sellers. seller. Now, the best bid, the best bid, the one which will be traded first, is the one with the highest or the lowest amount? Highest. Highest. So if you see here in the top, the highest price is the, the highest bid will be traded first. This is called the best bid. Clear? And best ask will be the price at which a seller is willing to sell the lowest. lowest. Let's say there are 10 sellers. Whose, whose trade will be sold first? The one who is willing to sell the lowest. So if you see the lowest of all will be at the top. This is called best ask. Everyone. What is the best bid? Best bid is the price which is mm -hmm. highest or lowest? Highest. Highest. And the lowest offer is called the best ask. Clear? How much is the difference between best bid and best ask here? 0.20. 0.20, right? Right? That is called spread. What is that called as? Spread. So bid ask spread is the difference between the best bid and the best offer. Everyone clear? Right? Yes. Now, let's deal one by one. Execution instructions. They indicate how to put or how to fill in the order. So there are two major types of orders. Market order and limit order. Market order. Now here, Jay, who is a very prominent trader from our group, and it's very easy. So Jay will help us explain what is a market order and what is a limit order. Go ahead, Jay. With, with your, I mean, keep the voice loud. Go ahead. Yes, sir. The market order are the order which are currently, which are placed at the current market price. Let's say if the stock is at running at 53 and I'm buying it instantly. So I don't wait for my limit, let's say, a bit louder, a bit louder. Market orders are the orders which are placed at the current market price. Like okay. Zero difference time. Wait, I don't wait for zero? zero waiting time. I love. I don't wait for the. I don't wait for the price. My price to come or the other price to come. Right. I just buy it or sell it at the current market. Price. Right. So so I'll explain you. I'll explain everyone in detail. Just tell the uh, tell the participants here that when you put the market order. What do you put in that price section? What is the zero. price that you put? You put zero. Yes. Or you can simply keep it blank, right? Yes. So once you do that, your shares will be executed immediately, right? Yes, sir. So market orders, the biggest advantage of market order is that whatever is the price in the market at that price, your shares will be executed immediately. Yes. However, the disadvantage is that the uncertainty in the price. If the prices are very volatile, you don't know at what price that will be executed. Correct? Yes. If I put a quantity of 100 shares of Apple or any company to buy or sell, and if I put zero or blank in the price section, that's called market order because my order will be executed immediately. So I have order certainty but I don't have a price certainty. I don't know what price it will be executed. This is done mostly when you quickly want to get rid of that position. Correct? So what is the certainty you get in this order? 
the certainty of the quantity but not the price yes your execution is certain but not the price clear you take the risk of the price everyone clear clear yes sir everyone contrary to this you have a limit order jay go ahead and explain everyone what is limit order limit order is the order which i <clears throat> which i am placing where i have a certain criteria that i am supposed to buy a certain quantity at a certain fixed price so i wait oh. for the current pri current price to match with my price and that's when okay. order get executed so you wait for your prices to come so the limit order for example if i want to put a buy order buy order here what are the bids available 876 875 and so on now if i put the buy order at 876 or above that price it will get immediately executed right yes that's not a limit order uh that's not a order that you want limit order is generally a limit buy order is placed below the best bid or above the best bid below the best bid below the best bid right so you wait for the prices to come to the point that you have decided clear so here you are very much particular about the price at which you want to buy or you want to sell the shares so limit buy order will be the order below the best bid and limit sell order will be the order above the best offer clear everyone so what limit order does is that they give you price certainty your order will be executed only at the price at which you have placed it but 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 once you place the order they will not be executed immediately why because right now the order is the the order is not at the price at which you want are you getting my point so if executed you will get the price which you desire but there is also a chance that what if the prices don't come to that point in the day then there is a possibility that the order may not be executed at all are you getting me so what is certain year and what is not certain year come on everyone what is certain in limit order and what is uncertain the price is certain price is certain price is certain but execution itself is uncertain clear because if your price does not reach on that point in the trading day then your order gets cancelled automatically which we will understand when we do validation validation means day order most of the orders are day orders that if they don't come if your prices don't reach at that point on the day then your order automatically gets cancelled clear everyone everyone clear with the difference between limit order and price uh, or market orders in market orders and limit orders the opposite is the case in market orders execution is certain but the price is uncertain in limit order price is certain but price is certain but the execution itself is uncertain clear yes there are various types of limit order limit buy order it is an order where your uh, you, you know it's an order which remains pending if no one is willing to sell you at your price so limit buy order is a order below the best price limit sell or uh, uh, yeah limit sell order is the order above the best ask price but you should also have an equivalent amount of counterparty to take a trade if they are not there then the order will cancel out market limit order very interesting market limit order now here what is the best bid 876 876 if i want if i want the order to be executed immediately and i also want the price certainty then i may put up an order above the best bid let's say i will put 877 so at 877 i will get the order and also the price that is called market limit order it is an buy order which is pay priced above the best best offer so you're about the best bid but it should be about the best offer so how much is someone offering you 876.2 so i may have to put if i put 877 definitely my order will be executed clear everyone and if you are desperate enough to sell but with a fixed price if you are a seller where will you look at you look at the bids how much is what is the best bid here 876 so you will have to 
come down and sell it at 876 or below that. Let's say you sell at 875. So there is surety that your order will be executed and also surety that you will get the price that you want because you're go going beyond the best ones. Clear? So market limit order is generally placed when someone is very desperate enough to buy or sell the security and also wants the price certain. Clear? Contrary to this, you have a standing limit order. Standing limit order is where the order is remaining unfilled because the price had, has not reached to your point. So let's say you have put up a price which is not right now available in the market. So that's called a standing limit order. Behind the market order, a buy order placed below the best bid. So your the best bid is 876. And if I if I'm putting my if I'm in the top five below the best bid, right? Then that's called a behind behind the market order for a buy. For the sell, it will be it will be above the best ask. Clear, everyone. Everyone, anyone, any doubts here? Please let me know. So the standing limit is not in the five, right? Is not in the five. In the five? No, like, standing limit. Yeah. So it is it is waiting to trade. So the yeah. order may end up remain unfilled if there is no trader who is willing to trade at that price. So mm -hmm. all of these are unfilled, by the way. They are waiting to trade. They are all, you can say, uh, they are all, you can say, they are standing orders. Because these orders are not executed. Therefore, you see there. They are waiting to get executed. Now, if you want to get executed, you will have to go above the best bid or below the best ask. Are you getting okay. it? Okay. Yes. So any order which you see on the screen, they are not yet executed. However, they change very frequently, very fast in microseconds. So you'll probably, uh, you know, they, they'll fluctuate a lot. But at a particular point of time, the orders which are not executed, they're all, we can say they are just standing limit orders because they are, they are not yet executed. Clear? Yes. Now there is one more position called all or nothing orders, AON. This is order. This order is executed if your entire size is available. Only if your entire size is available. For example, if I want to buy hundred shares of Apple at ninety eight, but the order the, there is no quantity at that ninety eight. So normally, what happens if there is let's say twenty quantity, twenty will be bought and the eighty will be remaining, right? In the normal situation. Yes. But in AON orders. The order will only go if there are 100 shares. Otherwise, it will not go. Clear. It will only be filled if there is entire quantity at that particular, uh, there is a depth at that particular price or they will not go into execution. Clear? Mm. Right? Now, there are two different types of orders uh, through which people try to hide their real intentions. Uh, they try to make the trades anonymous and that is hidden orders and iceberg orders minor difference between both hidden orders are orders that you have put in but they are not visible they are only visible if there is a counterparty with with your price and quantity clear so they are not exposed so let's say i've put in i've put a limit order i've put a limit order of 1000 shares at I can say here of 875, but that won't be reflected here. That will only be reflected if there is someone willing to sell 1000 at 875, right? By doing this, what happens? My trade is anonymous so that there is not, see, if you see the trades here, the, the sellers always will look at what is the demand and supply in the market? What is the demand in the market, right? And the buyers will always see this, what is the supply in the market. And accordingly, they will change their bids and ask. Isn't it? I'm sure Jay who trades here uh, can tell us that they will always look at the bid and best bid and best ask. And accordingly, they will put their trades, right? Most of the time you see the chart, right? What are the best bid and ask? And then you put the trades, right? Yes. But, but if there are hidden orders, you will not see the, not see them in the, let's say all of a sudden, if 
someone like Jay would see that there is a huge buy order of instead of three, there is a three thousand buy order. What will he do? What would you normally do, Jay? If you you if you are on the best ask, and if there's all of a huge demand of three thousand, do you keep your trade or you cancel it out? I cancel it out, sir. Why would you cancel it out? Someone who's willing to pay bigger price than I am. Yes, price. someone is desperate enough to buy. So you people immediately cancel out and then they keep on raising the price. Correct. Yes. That's what the people who want to sell they will do. So why should I disclose the quantity? I have a choice now. Not everyone has this choice, by the way. But there are some special orders available where under the hidden orders, your order will only be exposed when there is a counterparty with the same quantity and price. Clear? Yes. But remember, hidden orders have a low priority in the order book. For example, now this is very interesting. Okay, listen to this carefully. Let's say I have shown my order of thousand shares at eight seventy five, and uh, let's say your uh, Deepthi has put up an order of thousand shares at eight seventy five, but her order is hidden. We both have put the orders. My order is not anonymous. Her order is anonymous. Now, if the you know now let us understand that trading happens in electronic form, so the computer. maps everything right automatically whose trade will be executed first the one who has disclosed or the one who has not disclosed 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 so there is an order priority that hidden orders will will not be the priority those which are anonymous orders will not be the priority visible orders will be executed first and then the hidden orders got it so they have a low priority in the order execution book clear then you have iceberg orders iceberg from the movie titanic you can know right what do you see only a small tip at the top okay. but below the ocean there is a huge so yeah. only a part of your order is disclosed let's say you want to buy 1000 shares but only 100 shares are disclosed as soon as that 100 gets traded the new batch of 100 will be disclosed or 200 will be disclosed so the disclosure comes in stages only when the previous order gets executed right yes those are called iceberg orders everyone cleared with this yes sorry yeah yes in it out yeah no okay. so iceberg your orders will be revealed in stages only when the previous order gets executed so you never know what is the entire quantum of order it will happen only in stages right so what's the use of iceberg orders i don't want the market to be uh, impacted by my buy or sell order i don't want to create a panic and i don't want to the price to be against me these these are the strategies used by block brokers also so if you are going to put up a huge quantity for buy or sell definitely traders will see and they will pull back from the trades that they have already put in okay. right so, so i don't want to create a huge impact because of the huge chunk of trade that i'm trying to put i don't want the sellers to run away or i don't want the buyers to run away when i'm putting a huge quantity on the deck so you will just play this is what uh you know people in in block trading do they they apply various strategies and various uh you know uh, ways through which they will execute a large chunk of order in stages so they don't want the price to be impacted too much got it this is because because they are being paid to get the best price they are being paid to get the execution the block traders the block dealers by the way okay yes <clears throat> now we we dealt with execution instruction they will tell you how to fill the order validity instructions will tell you when should you fill the order so day order as i already discussed they are only available for a day at the close of the day if the order is pending it will get cancelled automatically right gtc gtc are good till cancelled they will remain until the price is reached if the price is never reached they will still be pending for for long time 
got my point so day orders are valid only for day only for the time period right and good till cancelled are valid till they get executed they so they will always be remained in the account till your price does not reach there is one more order immediate or cancel immediate or cancel very interesting the name itself has the meaning you put the order either it executes immediately or it gets cancelled so you are the priority we have a priority to fill the quantity in part or in full but you want it immediately when would you be using this order when you are having a bullish position sorry when you are having a bullish position and see on the listing day on the listing day a lot of people use this immediate or cancel for example let's say on the listing day the share may open up at a huge price right yes. so and after that you don't know the share may go much high or much low so many people use this at that time immediate or cancel so at that point immediately my share should should be sold if there's a huge spike if not then i don't want it to be sold correct so you may use it based on your perception based on your expectation fill or kill fill or kill is like immediate order here the priority is to fill the total quantity instantly or get cancelled in immediate or cancelled total or partial is allowed but in fill or kill the quantity should be there if i put 100 shares it should get executed immediately or it should get cancelled clear everyone minor difference between immediate or cancel and fill or fill or kill in immediate or cancel even the part shares will be executed in fill or kill only the total should be executed or nothing are you with me on this everyone yes then very easy good on close and good on open so when the market opens at that time only the order is filled and executed if not cancelled and good on close is where your trades will be executed only on the closing part of the trading day right or else they get cancelled so good on close can be filled only on the closing time good on open can be only filled on the opening time beyond this timing they will automatically get cancelled so validity instructions are all about when the trade will be executed clear then finally you also have stop orders what is stop order very interesting stop orders are orders to stop your loss so they are also called as stop loss orders for example let's say here i have already bought the share at uh, let's say any price i have already bought the share at uh, a, uh, 900 right and what is the price now the price is falling correct yes so i don't want the share price to fall below let's say 850 so what i'll do is that i've already put an order at 850 for sell but it will only get executed if if the share price is breaches 850 clear so what will happen here if the share price reaches 850 or goes below that my shares will automatically be sold clear but if if the price does not reach at 850 by the end of the day what will happen my trade will get cancelled everyone my trade will get cancelled cancelled right so what are buy stop orders they are used by short sellers if the underlying price is starts going up if your price going starts going up because you are a short seller what do you want you want the price to go down but if your prices are going up you are suffering losses right so contrary to what i said i what i said was was basically sell stop order so your sell stop orders are used by long traders where you are selling the stock if it goes beyond a point buy stop orders are used by short traders where you will buy the shares if it goes beyond a point now that point is decided by the trader that how much is the loss the trader is willing to take let's say whenever i buy a share my loss the maximum appetite that i have is 20% so i at 20% i will put the sell stop order so when i will instruct these are pre instructions that goes into the system 
Once you punch it, at any point your share breaches that 20% mark, right? Your orders will be automatically squared off. Clear? Everyone? So here, I will again show you this, that let's say if the price is 100, and if I have a long position, which order should I take? Which stop order should I put if I have a long position? Sell stop order. Sell stop order, right? So my sell stop order will be, let's say at 95, correct? Because five is the loss that maximum I want to bear. So if the price goes below 95, my shares will be automatically sold. And if I have a short position, I'm worried about the increase in price. So let's say at 105, if I have a short position, I may put a buy stop order at 105. So if the price goes above 105, my shares will be automatically squared off. My loss will be limited and my position will become zero. Clear everyone? Anyone, any doubts with stop loss orders? Most of the stop loss orders have day, are day orders where they get cancelled by the end of the day. Clear? So three things we had to discuss here. Execution, validity and clearing. Clearing are the instructions basically how to settle the trades well, the clearing or the settlement can, if you remember at the start of the day of discussion, the settlement can be done by cash or by delivery of asset. Cash settlement means only the difference of buying and selling will be exchanged. Clear? So one of the participant pays to another participant. They both don't pay. Are you getting me? Yes. That is called cash settle. Cash settle. In delivery, the buyer pays to buy the asset. And the seller receives the price for selling the asset. So in delivery, you basically take the delivery of the asset. So you, you don't exchange for difference. It's not cash at all. You actually pay the amount and get the assets in your stock. So that's the 2F settlement. Most of the exchanges, uh, you know, pre-inform you that whether the, the delivery will be, or whether it will be cash settled or delivery settled. For example, in futures and options, for stocks, mostly it is in future and options for stocks, mostly it is cash settled. Cash settled. However, in many cases in commodities, they can be cash settled or they can also be delivery. So you can also take the physical delivery of the commodities in many cases. That, however, depends on the rules set by the exchange. Clear? Okay. So that's set about validity and other instructions. So that's the different types of, uh, you know, order instructions. Now let's move to the next part, which we have already covered in bits and part. That is a primary and secondary market. What is primary market? Guys, primary market is a market where the issues are, issues are raised or the capital is raised for the first time. It's first called time. the new issues market, which we say as IPO, initial public offering, right? Everyone in the public offering, the company comes and sells securities and raises capital, right? If it does for the first time, we call it as IPO. If it does it again and again, we call follow on public offer or seasoned offerings, right? Once the issues are, once the securities are sold in the public, in the primary market, then people can buy and sell the securities in the secondary market, secondary secondary market, market. The stock exchange, right? Now, how does the primary market work? First, primary market, you need the help of investment bankers, which will place the security in public and raise capital. That is called public offering. So public offering is done by book building process. A book building process is the process where, where book build, where investment banks will, you know, determine the price of the IPO and people will put in the application. The investors will put in the applications. And then at a particular price, the investment bankers normally put a range of price. Let's say the range is 195 to 210. So people will put in their applications at that range. And accordingly, the book is built and the price is concluded. That is called book building process. The book building process normally takes around two to three weeks to, to, you know, to file and execute everything. And then the issue is raised. If the company is in a hurry, 
if the company wants capital immediately, mostly in the cases of bonds, then we have an accelerated book building process where you can also say the, uh, you know, the price, you know, is the range is very narrow or the price is generally fixed. So you have an accelerated book building process where if you want to execute the issue immediately, you can go with that process. The investment bankers gives you to offer, as we discussed in the start, underwriting offer and best offer. Underwriting offer where they, where they take the guarantee that we will help you, uh, that we will subscribe the issue. So let's say when Facebook wanted to come up with an IPO, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Citibank all together came and did the underwriting. So they said that, don't worry, we will help you raise the 100% capital. So that's called guarantee, uh, underwriting offer. In the best offer, in the best effort offering, sorry, not best offer, best effort offering, the investment bankers will not commit to you. The, that 100% issue will be subscribed. They will do their best. Of course, so where will they charge you more? In the underwriting offering or the best offering? Underwriting offering. In the underwriting offering. Underwriting. So in public offering, the merchant bankers or the investment bankers have a very prominent role there. The issue takes time and it is very costly because you have to do road shows, you have to you know, issue prospectors, you have to reach out to the investors, potential investors, you have to do a lot of conferences. Uh, I, I had uh, been an IPO analyst in 2011-12 and I had covered more than I should say 40-60 IPOs and I know the cost that they had to spend. They had to keep offices and uh, they, they had to keep meetings and conference calls at various prime locations and hotels and they had to throw lavish parties and all that high teas and lunch and dinner so it, it is it was a very costly process right and then you know you have to do a roadshow not only in india but abroad and in foreign investors you have to meet a lot of clients you have to serve them and all because you need capital so you spend a lot of money on an average around five to ten percentage of your capital is spent when you go for public offering Instead of that, instead of that, you can go for private placement. Private placement is where the company sells securities directly to a small group of investors who are willing to put huge money. This is a cheaper process than IPO, right? Everyone. But, but for that, you may require a specialist investment banker who has these potential investors willing to put a huge money, right? So private placement is not easy to do, but cheaper if happens. Clear? Now, many companies do not want to raise capital at one go, but they want to raise capital in stages. So for that, they don't want to again and again go to the SEC and take permission. So they do a process called shelf registration. Shelf, you know, bookshelf. What happens in a bookshelf? You keep the books, right? So shelf registration is a process by which the company does not sell all the shares in one transaction, but they sell it over a period. And for that, they don't have to file with the SEC again and again. Remember from reading 20 that in order to, in order to, you know, get the permission from SEC for sale of new securities, we had to file a form called S1. It is also called as red herring prospectus in many countries like India, right? So you had to file form S1, right? If you remember that from reading 20 of FRA, correct? You won't remember it because we had done it some 20, 30 years back. I can understand, right? And you're doing everyday revision. So how will you remember that? I understand. So basically, uh, this S1, you don't have to file it regularly if you are doing self-registration. Clear? You just have to file it once and then you can issue it in stages. Clear, everyone? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Right. So public offering and private placement. These are, these are called primary market. Primary market means how would you want to place the issue? Then you have secondary market. We've again and again discussed secondary market is all about trading the securities. They, they provide you the liquidity. They provide you a platform for buying and selling. Basically it's a stock exchange. Uh, but there are two types of tradings. Uh, that happens here the trading sessions can be call market and continuous market call market is a market 
Now I have mentioned here uniform pricing. We'll see that different types of pricing. But call market is where the tradings happen at a specific time. It does not happen continuously. There are time slots at which the trades will be executed. So the intent is to gather all the bids and ask, and they will be matched at one particular point of time. The trading cannot happen continuously throughout the day. It does not happen like in a typical stock market, which is which is a continuous market. A typical stock market that you see is a continuous market where the bids and ask are continuously put in the system, right? That is called a continuous market. In a call market, the bids and asks are arrive at a single price where the quantity demanded is as close as possible to the quantity supplied. So what is the biggest difference between call market and continuous market? In call market, the trading, you can put the order at any time, but the execution will happen only at a specific time period. Clear? This generally happens with bonds, with wholesale debt market. In wholesale debt markets, the, or the bonds are not traded continuously. The orders are put in the OTC segment, the alternative trading system. They are batched and they are mapped or traded at a particular point. So that's called a call market. Got it? Everyone? In call market, remember, the intention is to trade at a particular point of time and at a particular price. That's why it's called uniform price. Clear everyone? Right? Mm -hmm. Mostly when central banks want to issue securities in the market, they want the securities to be traded at a particular time and at a particular price. So when they sell, let's say, treasury bills in the, in the market, so they generally sell these tables in a call market, in, in, a, in a not a continuous market, in a call market. So big batch of buy and sell orders are matched at a particular point and at a particular price. That's uniform pricing. Clear? But a typical stock market works like a continuous market where the pricing, the buying and selling happens at, the trading happens at different, different pricing. So there is discriminatory pricing. The trade occurs at any time during the market hours right? The stocks are priced either by auction or by the dealers. By auction means that there are enough buyers and sellers which will, which will execute the trade or in a dealer's market where you are buying and seller, uh, you, uh, between buyers and sellers, there is a dealer who are willing to take a counter position. Clear everyone? A typical stock market that we see in our country or everywhere else is a continuous auction market. It's a Continuous auction market or market. A continuous dealer market. Clear? Everyone? Right? So that's what the primary and secondary markets are all about. Now, the three main types of markets. Uh, so basically how markets work, how they are executed. At times, the markets are managed by the dealers or at times the markets are managed by the buyers and sellers itself. So when the markets are dominated by the price given by the dealers, they are called price driven or code driven market or dealers market. Dealers market is a market specifically in OTC. In OTC over the counters, especially for bonds or currencies, it's the dealer who decides what will be the buy price and the sell price and people will trade at that price. For example, if I want to buy the currency, I don't decide at what price in, uh, I want to buy or sell. I have to trade at the price at which the banks quote me. Correct? That's called a that's called a quote driven market. Your quotes are fixed by the dealers. However, in a typical stock market, where, which is an order driven market, the buyers and sellers will put the orders based on their choice and that and then an electronic system will match them a computer will match them those are called order driven markets clear everyone yes. so order driven markets are matched automatically by the system now how does the system match it they have rules the, the, there are rules at place those are order matching rules and trade pricing rules 
order matching rules means which order will be executed first so tell me one thing when i put a buy order which order will be executed first best bid the highest order the highest price order and if i want to put a sell order the lowest price will be executed first right yes. that's called a price priority rule right but let's say if you and i we both put the order at the same price then whose order will be executed first if the price is same one with the lower quantity volume volume i can't hear you hello everyone the one, the, the one with the lower quantities uh no quantity is never a thing the computer does not see the quantity yes first first is the price price is the priority right the secondary preference goes to display hidden orders you remember and non anonymous orders so which orders will be executed first non anonymous non anonymous non anonymous that will be the visible orders will be executed first so first priority goes to price second goes to display and then the third goes timing which orders came first got it so the system is placed as highest price for buy lowest price for sell hidden non hidden that is display and then based on time that's how the computer automatically executes the orders clear yes everyone then there are trade pricing rules trade pricing rules after orders are matched which orders will go in first the system uses the trade pricing rules to determine the price see order will ensure which order will go in first trade pricing rules will determine the price we just saw that we had uniform pricing rules where you will all put the orders i have put the order first so my order will go in but at what price it will be executed that depends on the pricing rules so you have uniform pricing rules where the, all the trades are executed at the same price the market chooses the price that maximizes the total quantity traded so the market automatically chooses that's how the call market works right discriminatory pricing rule we just discussed here discriminatory pricing rule is basically with continuous markets right in continuous market what happens the uh, limit price of the order or code that arrived first first will be in the standing and will be executed right so the one who puts first gets executed first that's how a uh, you know if i have put at the same price you put at the same price so time becomes a priority then based on the time the orders will be batched the orders will be connected the orders will be executed clear in derivative pricing rules in derivative pricing rule remember derivatives are forwards and futures on stocks basically let's say futures of stock prices but this future prices are derived from the stock itself the stock itself the spot prices of the stock so here the price are derived from something else so that's why it's called derivatives so they match buyers and sellers who are willing to trade price obtained from other markets that is a spot market the executed price is generally the midpoint of the bed, best bid and best ask so the computer automatically will execute at the best price and the best price will be somewhere between the best bid and best ask clear so how is the price decided it can be uniform pricing in a call market it can be continuous different pricing in a discriminatory market in a continuous market uh, so the prices will be different for different trades or in derivative pricing the pricing will be based on the uh, based on the underlying asset clear so i've put the same slide again now let me show you how would it exactly execute how how that exactly will execute so guys let's take this example here very interesting this is an order book here you have three buyers a b and c with different quantity and limit price so the buyers price will be higher or the sellers or the offer price will be higher offer price offer offer price right so these are all standing orders am i correct yes right? so let's say your mr x buys submits a limit buy order buy order he wants to buy 35 contracts 
at price of 201 35 contracts at 201 so where will he look at if i want to buy 35 contracts where will i look at at the bid prices or at the offer prices offer prices offer offer pricing so when i'm putting 201 will my order get executed yes why because i'm i'm putting i'm Wanted putting at the price above the above the best ask best ask clear right so can i say i am putting a market limit order where i am putting a limit but it is above the best ask clear yes. everyone so he wants to buy at 201 and quantity of 35 can you tell me who is that as per the system the system will first execute my trade with whom? E. With D first. With D first. Why? Because D is willing to sell how much? 14 okay. quantities at 209. Correct? So with which my trade will be executed first with D. And then will I get entire quantity with D? No. No. I'll get only 14, 14. I want 35 contracts, but I've set the limit of 201. So now 14 minus 35, how much more remaining? 21 remaining. So then first I will trade with D and then I will D and then followed with, with, followed e. with E. With E, how much will I trade? With e, I will trade 14 contracts or 14 quantities and with E, I will trade 18 and then I will go to F, right? No. No, because F's price limit is higher. Yes. Clear. So how many orders will be executed? 32. 14 plus 18, 32 <laughs> will be executed, 3 will be pending. Clear? Got the yes. point everyone. So what is the average price here? I can say 14 shares will be traded at, I'll get at 200.9. Yes. And around 18 shares I will get at, sorry. 201. Yeah, 18 shares I'll get at 201. So basically I'll get, I'll be paying 640, 6430.6 for how many, how many shares? 32. 32. So the average price I'll have is 200.956 or I will put 96. Clear everyone. That yes. will be my average trade price of execution. Everyone clear? Yes. Now, very interesting. What will be the order book after this trade is done? Can someone tell me? The A, B and C, will it still be pending? Yes. yes. A will be pending at 60. B was 28 and 32. They will be as it is, right? And, 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 and one more thing will be there. What will be the next price after this? 201 for the remaining three contracts. Very good. So I will put here the next price will be 201. For, for whom? Who was the guy's name? X. Correct? So for X, I will put, sorry. For X, I will put how much? How much quantity was he left with? Three. Three. 32 were dealt, right? So three was left at 201. And the D and E, will they be now existing? No. No. So now there will be F, the seller directly, with how much quantity the F had? F had 35. So 35 at the price of 201.2. So new trading book will be somewhat like this. Are you getting it, everyone? After the trade is done. Clear? Make sense? Just see the trading book after the trade is executed. Now, after A, B, and C, the first will be in the queue will be 
the first in the queue will be x x why because x has put the best offer uh, best bid clear everyone so this will be the revised this will be the change major change in the book after after the trade is executed everyone clear with this yes yes so three main types of markets are discussed code driven who decides here the price the dealer the dealer puts in the buy and sell price order driven here who decides the price the market the market buyers and sellers decide the price correct they will help you the execution but there is also one more market where you will have to take the help of broker that is called brokered markets brokered markets are generally markets where the product that you are buying or selling is very niche is very unique here there is not too much of liquidity the market is very unique for unique products like uh exotic cars or vintage cars or real estate properties every property is unique right so you can't have all the properties of the same variety you you every property has some properties are c facing some properties are of different square feet some properties are of different amenities so every property is unique you require a specialized broker here yeah, the broker arranges for the trades between clients right they are dealt for real estate intellectual properties large block of securities fine art correct so for them you have to go through the brokers market clear everyone these are very rare and they are mostly in the case of some exotic items everyone clear yeah. well that's it the last part is that what is the characteristics of a well functioning financial market what is the what are the features of a good financial market so well first the market should be complete it means that the instruments needed to solve investment risk management are available so anyone who wants to raise capital or invest they have all the choices available that is called a complete market second there should be enough buyers and sellers so there should be enough liquidity if not rope in the dealers have arbitrages they will increase the liquidity there should be operational efficiency so to buy and sell you don't have to pay huge price the transaction cost should be as low as possible then too many participants will enter in and finally there should be information efficiency so the information should not be hidden it should be more accessible and transparent then only people will trust the financial markets so those are the qualities of a good financial market right now of course financial markets can uh, can go out of control if not regulated so otherwise they will turn up into a scam and therefore we have regulators at place so what is the objective of regulators well the first objective is to protect the protect the interest of investors how would they do that well they will ensure that there are no frauds there are no principal and agent problem which you understood from corporate governance so there is no conflict of interest there is fair activity the market does not favor the high net worth individuals at the cost of retail investors right they are for mutual benefit of not only brokers but also investors and all participants overall right the companies which are under capitalized right or the companies which are exploiting investors they are penalized and regulatory action is taken against such people or some insider trading and other activities and you are ensuring that you know people maintain their margin so the liabilities are funded and all so so there is no default in the market that's that's what the job is of the regulators clear that's what the job of sec securities exchange commission or fca in uk that's what their job is clear everyone so that's the end of one of the large topics of uh, you know our equity investments basically market organization and structure this is this is what the end of the topic is we've covered a range of things and when you once read on through this these they, they can probably ask you questions from any small part here but they are very important for you to understand how the overall market works right and we where we had different types of sums when we were dealing with margins so they are very much surely going to ask you one or two examples from this margin calculations so do practice that clear well that's the end of our reading number 36 okay any doubts anyone Uh, so the OTC market 
can mm. we say that uh, it is uh, traded on ats yes 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 otcs are traded between two people there is an exchange there so mm -hmm. all the otcs trades are they they can be traded on ats or they can be dealt individually between you and me okay so let's say we both make up a contract and i buy or sell you property that's also otc but not on a platform now these days okay. you have recognized platforms computerized systems for like dark pools i told you where people can buy and sell with some counterparty on a platform but there there is no one to take guarantee so you can do it one on one or you can do it through some do it on ats can i tell you something like olx olx or mm -hmm. ebay what do you do on ebay if you want to buy let's say if you want to buy something you can buy it and you sell it uh, there is a buyer and seller directly right yes is there any exchange involved no no is there any assurance of your trade no there is always no. risk correct so ebay is very much like you can say ats got it for okay. your simple understanding i can say ebay like in india we have olx or quicker they are, they are very much like ats you can buy and sell individually based on the prices that are put by the seller or the prices that you put as a buyer and you execute it there is no counterparty to ensure it correct okay so it can but be an example market, of but on a stock mm -hmm. market or an amazon if i if i want to buy or sell on amazon amazon is the middleman right yes so amazon takes the guarantee or i can say amazon is the counterparty there i don't know who the seller is i deal with amazon the seller does not know who the buyer is they indirectly we indirectly trade through amazon i'm just trying to explain you the financial market through the retail market so if you are buying and selling through amazon you can say it's more like a exchange but if you're trading it on an ebay or olx platform it's more like a one on one market but on a platform so that's an ats okay. now if i directly come at your home we both know each other and if i sell you my car right i we did not go to the system so that's also on otc but not on a platform okay okay clear yes any further doubts anyone okay